podcast number 843. Uh, it's around the holidays now when uh, when this is going up. I mean, you may listen to this in July of 2019. I don't know when this is. And if it is July of 2019 and you listen to this, you just shit your pants because I said that. So clean yourself up and continue listening uh, because this is a very special episode. Ian McShane, who I'm a huge fan of. I l- fucking loved Deadwood. And, uh, and Ian's just one of those guys that when he's in something, you just can't take your eyes off him. So uh, I was delighted that he decided to come into the Nerds Podcast studio and, and chat with me. Uh, but let me tell you about some corkboard stuff first. Chris Gable writes, My friends and I have a podcast called Grown Up Human Comic People, and our show covers comics and life issues uh, complete with drinking and swearing. Uh, what we do is unique because we focus on comics that are just starting out to give them a bump to new authors and comic artists. Uh, we can be found on all podcast marketplaces for free, as well as Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Instagram. The website is grownuphumans.com, uh, and the major players are Daniel, Dan, Greg, Jared, Jared, Becky, and Chris. So uh, there you go, Grown Up Human Comic People. Also, LA's Comedy Festival Riot LA is coming up in January 19th through the 22nd. It's downtown LA, and this year's list of performers is insane. Uh, you can see Mel Brooks. Yes, Mel Brooks, Maria Bamford, Jonathan Katz, Ali Wong, Eugene Merman, Nikki Glazer, Kalkanane, Tig Notaro, Adam Devine, Rachel Bloom, Whitney Cummings, Todd Berry, Bobcat Goldthwait. So many more amazing comics as well. Tickets and info can be found at riotla.com. Uh, so here we go. This is Nerdist Podcast number 843 with Ian McShane, who is promoting The Hollow Point, which is in theaters uh, December 16th. So you should absolutely have Patrick Wilson is also in that, uh, and uh, the movie looks amazing. Uh, so check it out. Look at the trailer on YouTube. Go see the movie this weekend. Uh, here's the Nerdist Podcast with Ian McShane. Katie, roll the thing. Now entering Nerdist.com. It's the holiday season. Is there eight of little ones inside there? There's, yeah, it's a nesting chocolate. Uh, they just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Do you need anything? Are you good? Do you the want is fun. Water? No, no, I'm not fun. Excellent. What are you guys shooting afterwards? Are you doing a magazine cover? No, no, what are we doing? George what? Pinocchio. George Pinocchio, I think, with him. George oh, cool. Up in here for ABC, whatever, yeah. Very cool. Well, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming all the way to our studio in the middle of town. But you live, you live. Place. No, I live at the beach. I just got back from New York yesterday last night, and I live at the beach, so it was nice. Get down to Venice, unpack. My Hi. wife went to Detroit to see her mum, so I got up at 5 o'clock this morning, did the washing, Chris. Yes, you do. You know? Yeah, as you have to. You're I lime to. machine those machines, you know? <laughs> Getting back in. A little bit of that, a little bit of bleach. You do your... Got up, did a little walk on the beach, and then went in for a... Yeah, got me to see you. You're, you a, you're a do-your-own-laundry kind of guy. Oh, well, yeah, in my day, you did. That's what you did, yeah. You had to do your own. And had to do your own. Did you ever feel like that if you got to a point in your career where you refused to do your own laundry, that that was, that was going to be a problem? Like that, that you, do, you feel, do you keep grounded by doing your own laundry? Uh, well, no, I've, I've, I've married three times and none of my wives do laundry, so... Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying it's just important you do your own laundry. And your own cooking. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. Have be to, have what do you like to cook? What do you cook? I haven't cooked much lately because I've been on the move, so I don't travel with a little hot plate and things like that. You know, people do. I think Jeremy Irons once said he, he traveled with all the scarves to make hotel rooms look like. I thought, <laughs> where the hell did you come from, Jeremy? You know, <laughs> a brothel in Istanbul somewhere. No, I don't travel with anything. I like the rooms to look like they are. No cooking. Uh, no, well, now, you know, well, it used to be difficult. I mean, I remember the old days when you do a play outside of London, you was nowhere to eat. You do a play, you finish and be like, you go to the local Chinese and have um, chow, mein and, chow mein and chips. Right. After the theater. There's nowhere else open, either an Indian or a Chinese restaurant. No, now, of course, it's all everybody. They, they don't want to be in rock and roll. They want to be in cooking. Right. Chef, you know, or the shows on TV. But nobody cooks anymore. You know that these cooking shows on TV, baking shows, cooking shows, they're hugely popular. But nobody actually <laughs> People just like does watching it. They, people exactly. Cook, yeah. They buy the books. They give them Christmas. <laughs> but nobody cooks anymore. <laughs> nobody cooks. They just go out. You know? Well, I – you. You've been – have you been married since 1980? Nice. Since 70 – yeah. 80, since 1980. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, what's some – I just got married in August. What is some good 
solid wedding advice. Oh, for- um, spend a lot of time apart. I have, <laughs> especially in the bathroom. <laughs> Especially in the bathroom. Have, if you can, mm-hmm. separate bathrooms. Very, very important. You know, that's, yeah, that, that, that. And if you smoke, you can always say, uh, but you don't do that. I really. don't. See, yeah. No, exactly. So you have problems saying, I don't think I'm just going out for a cigarette. Like when you're on a film set with a bad actor or a boring <laughs> person, you go, uh, I'm just going out for a cigarette while you discuss your problems Shit, with the director. So you just you know said that now. So if halfway through this, you're like, I'm just going to go for a smoke. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll smoke. know what you're doing then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm worried you're going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I can't that. make the excuse. I am very excited that, I mean, not only I'm such a huge fan of yours, but also, I mean, De- Deadwood to me, you know, and my wife, incidentally, her great-great-grandfather was George Hurst. Oh, my goodness. And so she'd never seen it. So when we first started dating, I was like, well, surely you've seen Deadwood. Oh, no, no. Actually, I didn't point. I'd forgotten. And I said, have you seen Deadwood? And she goes, no, I think my great, great grandfather's. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding? Oh, my God. <laughs> and, uh, and I showed it to her. And her reaction was, he was just misunderstood. Like, that was her reaction. No, that, she, that's what I said about my character. <laughs> She's stolen that line. Hers was a bad guy, you know that. <laughs> he was He's a, a really bad he guy. He was misunderstood. That's the, what they say about every bad character. Now. No. You're complex, complicated. He was, mis- he was a complicated. It was a different it's time. It's a different time. He just went in and got all the la- leases for the, you know, the gold and the ore and, you know, Screwed everybody that was in his way. But an early Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> He's not the same. Well, you've got, you've got Hearst Towers. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. But that doesn't. Sam Simeon is very strange. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It is, it is, amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. It was such a, a, just a strange feat in the, you know, in the early 1900s. Like, let's just build a castle there. I don't know. Bring nothing. it all over from Italy, whatever. Bring yeah. everything over and from ship over. it all in there. It was just like an architectural salvage. And in the end, all you wanted was a sled. Rosebud. <laughs> <laughs> that was a movie was a... made by a hack director. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who, a real hack director. Who just he was only doing a hatchet job on this very nice man. I saw it again recently. It is pretty good, actually, you know. Yeah. It's quite remarkable. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, you know what's remarkable to me is that how uh, how empathetic people were to Swearingen's character in that because he I, I ostensibly should be like well he's kind of the bad guy really he's sort of the villain. Well, I don't. You see, I, I think the genius of the show is Milch, Milch, David Milch, who is a bona fide genius. Yes, the guy. I mean, that's it's all about him. I mean, he's the one that envisioned it. I mean, I remember when he first went in, I think he pitched them Rome, and they said, we're already doing a series about that. He said, fine. And his mind racing quickly, I'm on a Western. <laughs> then he came up, but um, what he came up with was really, it's the story of America. I mean, it's a very political show in terms of what it does is tells you how, if you like, a certain civilization is created. You know, there's a lot of bad guys, a lot of guys around. The girls who are around are all whores or whatever or treated badly by the men. And suddenly civilization creeps in, law comes in. And we were just getting going when, you know, HBO, to their eternal shame, canceled it. You know, well, that's, that's hubris and ego, which happens in every business. The 17 different versions of why didn't, you know, did no more than three seasons. But thank God we had the three seasons. Well, it was yeah. a remarkable time, yeah. Because it, it seemed like, obviously, to me, is one of the great, tragedies of television is that just that last season just ends and you're like oh boy shit's gonna get crazy what what yeah. what, what just happened what do i know but you guys thought Tragedy. it was coming back at the time well it all it, it all yeah we had done well we've been told and then suddenly but of course they hadn't picked up those little slips of paper which sure. uh, you know in a month and uh, before that happened they just they canceled it who knows whatever went on you'll hear 10 different stories of it it was very expensive yes it was very complicated milch works in a certain way but it was definitely the best i mean i think for all of us involved, because we still talk about it. I mean, there's talk about it now. They're writing a script. But, you know, I'll believe it when I'm on that muddy street in my boots. You know, <laughs> I know. Looking I at s- Timothy Oliphant, both of us saying, are we here again doing it, or is it just a, a pipe dream? I would, I, was, I, would, I would see Kim Dickens quite a lot because she's doing that other Walking she's Dead very, show. Yeah, she's yeah, amazing. And yeah. every time I see her, I'm like, you know what I mean? Dead, you? She's like, I mean, we're dead. I hear about it, but I don't know. Yeah, we all hear, happening. and then we get in touch, and then they say... David's writing a script. I mean, but, you know, now would seem a perfect time. It's 10 years since they, they elbowed it. It's 10 years, you know, it's kind of like it's perfect time. Tim's got a huge following from, um, you know, the show he did, Justified. Yep. All the other people are free. Most of, well, none of us will be free for much longer. Right. But maybe it is just, you know, 
blowing smoke up our asses. <laughs> but <laughs> Swearingen, knows? they were all real people. They were all Swearingen. Yeah, was a real Swearingen, guy. yeah, Swearingen was a real guy, and so was Bullock, who was mm-hmm. a friend of. Um, what do you call it? The first, uh, what was your, was your friend? Theodore Roosevelt mm-hmm. became a big friend of his in the justice. Uh, yeah, it was all based on, um, on real stuff, but obviously Milch took his liberties with it, whatever. I don't think that probably that Swearingen, the original guy, was half as interesting as Milch wrote him to be, you know, and got, but the, got the gift of playing him. Everyone was, I mean, it was, it was like um, well, that's Old Mil- West but, Shakespeare. Well, that's what Milch does. Milch's genius is that he, you know, he didn't, he didn't have me come down the stairs every week and kill somebody and make a long speech, which he would if it was on, right, you know, normal TV. What he did was he built every, every guy and every woman on that show had their own individual personality. And it was the story of the town. And as the town grew... And how, you know, um, Swearingen learned to live with Bullock. Bullock learned to live with him. It's like, you know, you take care of your side of the street. I'll take care of mine. And then when Hearst came in, they both realized that's real power. Yeah. How do you deal with real power? You shut your fucking mouth until something happens. That's why it was all, you know, you didn't have any big face-offs between Swearingen and and Hearst. Because what? Well, Swearingen knew. It was ridiculous. You know, he got the pleasure of killing one of his men, but that was it. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that... That fight scene between your guy and his guy. Oh, yeah, that was phenomenal. And the it? genius part about it was how much it fucked him up for, like, because it's so graphic and he rips the guy's eyeball out. Yeah. And, and, and he, in, I think in most television shows, you know, he'd write it off and be like, yeah, I just killed that guy. But it, it legitimately shakes that guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and you see the, everyone's vulnerability. Well, I think that's what the show did. The show, did, you know, upended norms. It wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a typical TV show. I mean, it came it's a long time ago now, you know. I mean, we did the pilot 14 years ago. Oh, my God. 2002. That's crazy. Then we waited a year before they started the show actual, the show proper in August 2003. Mm-hmm. Then we did three years. Seems like a lot longer. Seems like, I mean, it seems like a... Uh, it seems like we did more shows than we did because it was a remarkable... Um, time for everybody i mean it was you know everybody got on everybody brought their a game it's a remarkable three years of experiencing other actors who just love being there who was al to you did you did your relationship with him kind of develop through the three yeah well it developed through i mean i think it developed through david i mean because david writes in a way which is which they gave in space to at the time obviously because we cancelled after three years they got a little wary of it but david tends to write a scene then sees it played, like most good showrunners do, and then sees where that's leading to, and then doesn't sort of shoot the next bit. He goes back and rewrites. But we were in a very fortunate position, Chris, because at the time when we did it, we were all at the ranch, Gene Orchard's ranch up in San Clarita, mm-hmm. Santa Clarita, and everybody was there. Everything was there. The writers were there. The sets were there. The, the, um, the extras, the horses were there. So there was no, like, location. You didn't have to be in three locations a day. He could actually right and say an editing editing facilities were there so everybody was everybody was there the entire time so he could say let's take an hour i'm going to change the next scene after lunch or i'm going to adjust this or we'll do this it only meant crossing the road and we had two sound stages there. Mm-hmm. so it only meant moving up the street physically for a location or moving back into a studio so it wasn't it was a it was a really as it was a, a most perfect way to do a show as i've ever met ever met do you like doing television because i think was it did yeah. you do love joy for nine seasons tonight? no 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 i had the big i had the i had the idea for love joy. i bought the um um original uh rights to the books in 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 85 with a great friend of mine alan McEwen. Tracy Ullman's yes. husband, Alan, who my dear friend. And um, Alan and I did one series for the BBC, but it was actually it was the first, one of the first independent shows because we produced it. Because they said, oh, we'll, we'll do it. And we said, no, what's the point? We'll do it. We'll produce it. But, you know, we'll do it with you. Give us the money and we'll take care of it. And we did one season. It was very successful. And then a guy called Michael Grade came in, who was um, rather, he flopped in America, but was one of those cigar chewing in like good old boys mm. back in England, became the BBC and said, oh yeah, this Charlotte will take over. And he'd previously had run-ins with Alan, because Alan was one of those very, Alan, you know, I've known Alan, Alan was a hairdresser the first time I met him on a movie back in 
If it's Tuesday, this must be Belgium. He was the hairdresser on it, but we became <laughs> very good friends. He was also Elizabeth Taylor's hairdresser. Oh, my God. That. But Alan then had always, had always a smart. He had his own shops in London, whatever, and he was a business guy, basically. <laughs> and he then saw television, and he, and he got this right, these two writers called Ian Lafrenet and Dick Clement, who did a great English series called Porridge, mm-hmm. The Likely Lads. And he ran their career, and when and we were all great friends at the time, and when I found Lovejoy, I said, Ian, I wanted to write it. So Ian, Alan, and I went to England and wrote that. And then Michael Grade, he said to me, Alan said, do you want to do it? He said, because I'll step aside. I said, I don't want for fucking BBC. I said, we'll work with the BBC, but not for them. So we waited four years, and the guy that commissioned it, Jonathan Powell was then made overall head, and he came to Alan me, and we were on other projects, and said, "You know, love you." He said, "I always loved that show." He said, "Would you come back and do it again?" This is in 1989, and do it the same way you did before as an independent show. And we said, "Fine." Then we did five years, and we did 72 episodes because you know England's famous for saying it's a marvelous show, but we only want to do four. Right? <laughs> I did never, never understood that concept. You know, you people love it. Oh, people yes, love it. Yeah, let's do five then. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, yeah, because you know there's only like eight, mon- eight um, faulty towers. Right, yeah. So there really is only like eight shows. Right. But they're so great. I mean, they watch them and watch I mean, them you again. You think but it's so much more, yeah. No, but they're not. So when we did it, I said, well, we want two seasons and we want to do 20 at least, 10, 10 shows. And they said, great. And then at the first one, the first year, they, they liked it so much, we did a special. So we, did, we ended up doing, I think, 75 hours of TV. And, um, and we did it from 90 to 94. And then it seemed perfect. And then it's like, as you do when you're exposed like that on television, you then say, right, I'm going to do, you know, I just did t- voiceovers on TV for a few years. And said, so because you, you can't do TV anymore. Everybody goes, ah, it's Lovejoy, pretending to be somebody else. Cause you, <laughs> no, you are. You're so, <laughs> right. I mean, we, we, you know, those days we were getting like 17 million viewers. Oh, my God. Which in the, in the heady days of 92, 93 was pretty good. You know, nowadays they, they wet their pants if they get 8 million. You yeah. Know, whatever. But it's a different world. Um, so, yeah, so I just sort of... But it was a great show. Again, we had the wonderful Phyllis Logan, who went on to greater glory as uh, the lady downstairs in Downton Abbey. You know, yeah. She's great, Phyllis. And it was a great show to do. But then it was, yeah, it was... And also, I wanted to... I directed some of them. It gave me a, you know, it gave me a background in TV. So I directed the, the first one every year. So it gave me time to sort of prep it for, properly for a month. I didn't just come in and say, I'm doing it, direct this one. It sort of it was... It was properly done, and I enjoyed that. And then took a while off, and then, um, and then De- David. No, I didn't do any TV between that. I did another six-part series in '91, sort of a, a law firm. And then David, and then they came through with um, Deadwood. Why the hell they couldn't find anybody here? I don't know, but thank God they didn't. Sometimes names have got your know, parts have got your names on them for some reason. They go around where they finally find the right, the right guy. You know, right. Was there was there an audition process for that? Or did you no, meet no, with no, David? there was. Well, I mean, they'd seen me because you know, Sexy Beast was out by right. then, so there right. was sort of a lot of uh, inquiring about what do you want to do. But no, but Walter Hill, I knew Walter. Um, I didn't. I, we'd never worked together, but I knew him. And they said, they said, would you uh, would you come across an audition? And I met David, and then I then I did an audition for them. I just went in there and you know talked to him and blew it out the park. What's yeah. your audition technique? I'm curious to know what Ian McShane's audition technique is. Well, to go in there is if you know what you're doing, not to wait for them, you know. So I remember I just walked in and said, would you mind if you just stay here? I'm going out of the room again. I'll come and do this. And then to know it, to know it and own it. So I just treated them as if, you know, get out of my fucking way. <laughs> While I do this big speech and talk to them about whatever. And said, like, just let me do it. Don't sort of, you know, because there are people reading, you know, with you sometimes. And David just was there. I'd met him, and we talked about it. And he just said, you know, and that was it. And then we waited for the word from Chris Albrecht from on high, and it came within like a two two hours. Oh, my and, God. Uh, and that was it, yeah. So it was good. But, what? I mean, that was it. They were, they were, they'd been having trouble with that part. So why, I don't know. But the, luckily, it was, you know, it was, there it was. What do you think the rationale behind British television is where they only want to do a few episodes here and a few episodes I don't episodes know. There. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing. It's this... I don't really know. They don't... Well, they don't have syndication in the same way they do here because this is such a 
huge country. I mean, that's half of it. When they do TV, they want to they want to get a serious set of a set of you know episodes so they can sell them to syndication, right. and make the money on them. But BBC was like, well, it's certainly nothing to do with quality because I think you know, um, it's an, it still goes on, not so much anymore. They do eight now. <laughs> but they do, it's literally, they do eight, eight shows. But that's like a big year, you know, but, but it's like a big thought, well, we'll do eight, you know, or we'll see how it goes. But, you know, I mean, nowadays it's the goal. I mean, it is the golden age of TV now. What have you got, 450 cable shows vying there, together? I think there's a lot of really I think good. It literally is. Oh, there are a lot of yeah. really good stuff. It's when too people much. say, do you want to watch that? And you say, I've never, when do you get a chance to see it, you know? I know. And people who are able to watch everything, I don't know. They must not have jobs. I people are like, have you seen this? Have you seen this? No. You, no, I, no time for anything. I work. I mean, I can tr- catch up as much as I possibly can, but that's not a lot. But I wonder if some of it has to do, because I, I see the upside and the downside. The upside being, you know, you can really focus on quality for eight episodes but I also feel like there are certain characters, oh, it would have it been nice to see how that developed. Or it would have been nice to see where that person was in se- season three usually feels like that's where everyone's firing on all cylinders by the second or third season of a show. And I wonder how many amazing British shows just didn't get that chance to really lock in because it was just. They seem now to be more. Well, I mean, they seem now to be more um, on the BBC and the ITV seem more. In the sort of regular kind of like um, regular TV vein, mm-hmm. of shows like Call the Midwife, mm-hmm. the 30s, they stick to stock things that work. Well, they do them very well, and I'm, God knows I'm not knocking them, but they do them very well. But shows like Happy Valley, did you see that? Which is a sort of a story about a distraught female detective from the north. No. So like, it's a really good show, really interesting, interesting villain, a complicated home life for the cop, a female cop. Um, the diversity is with this very good actress, Sarah Lancashire, um, and very well written. Um, Peter Morgan's The Queen, they've just done that as a Netflix, which is a very good, apparently. I, mean, I can't, I mean, nothing bores me more than the home life of our own dear Queen, you know. <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> dear God, can you imagine? Get those corgis away from me. <laughs> you kick that fucking dog. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, will you please, you know? All that going on. Well, I guess it's just people going, oh, they eat breakfast too? Oh, like, no, I know, no, know. and they did go to the loo, yes. Yeah, they, exactly. that, that's, what? That's the only way to make anybody seem, you know, human is to imagine them squatting on the toilet, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, and then everybody seems to be quite, you know, normal. <laughs> but it is such a strange, I mean, I think Americans are so fascinated by that construct. You well, know? yeah, because, well, that's why they've always loved shows like, um, you know, Upstairs, Downstairs. Of course. And then Downton Abbey. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, now you've got your very own, you know, you've got your very own guy in there who's sort of the living example of that, you know. Sure. Of, you know. And then, of course, you know, Game of Thrones, which I know you were. Oh, Game of Thrones, yeah. Game of that Thrones. Was, oh, yeah, that was that was fun. That was fun. That was a. Uh, oh yes. Oh, the internet went mad when I gave it away. <laughs> all those, poor, oh, all those you, poor babies got really upset with themselves. Didn't you say themselves. something like, it's a fucking TV show? Didn't you say like, no, I said, on. it's Sits and Dragons, get over it. What, <laughs> somebody asked me, they said, you know, oh, you're giving too much away. I said, for fuck's sake, it's Sits and Dragons. What's, what's so big? And I knew HBO didn't care. I mean, they got, it just adds grist to the show. Everybody couldn't wait you know, to see more of it. Um, no, but everybody gets so precious now about shows. Um, it's like they don't want to give anything away, and you just give lots of little bits away or whatever, and they get, you know, this, I mean, God, they'll have you signing non-disclosure contracts to do everything. It's ridiculous. You yeah. Know? yeah. It's insane, as if you're going to go on and talk about it. Scripts now come, you know, with your name on them from some obscure independent film. Say, well, look, we'll, we'll get this to you in a day and a half, and it's Dropbox will do, and I, you know, obviously I'm, you know, a Luddite <laughs> when it comes to, I mean, I could, you know, I could probably use the very first Commodore 64, I'd still be very happy using it, you know what I mean? But apart from it, but it does, it comes in, you go, what the hell do I have to get this? And I call Lisa, who's sitting over there, I say, darling, how do I read the script? Well, it's in your name, you have to go to Dropbox, take it below, sign a non disc Say no. <laughs> tell them no. It's not like I tell them no without – I've got me bothered. How many so Ian McShane roles almost happened oh, and didn't because of a password lock? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And you get creator. bored with doing it. You think, well, this is as boring as this. And when you get to the script, it'll be even more boring. You know? But you know what's great about that is that it, I feel like that's sort of a good way to live of – 
is this too cut? Is this, does this seem fun to me? Is it just feel like a headache? It's a headache. I, I'm not going to do it then. Why would I want a headache? <laughs> well, exactly. You know, it's like with Game of Thrones. They came to me. They said, Game of Thrones are interested. I said, I don't want to be in a, don't want to do a series. They said, no, it's a one-off. I said, great. Whatever it is, I know it'll be good because they wouldn't offer you otherwise. Right. And I said, my kids, my grandkids would kill me if I didn't do it. So I've got to do it. And it was fun. And Rory McCann, who's the hound, who's a great guy. So we had a great time there in Belfast for a week. But I must say, that location, wow. Belfast is where they make it. Wow. And it's, uh, it's HBO Europe. It's not HBO America. Because I, I said, I'll see all my old English pals, Charlie Dance, Stephen. They said, oh, no, they're all dead. <laughs> they killed them all. I said, well, they asked for a raise. <laughs> and they, and they, they wouldn't pay them in English pounds. Or that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, you know, that, that, that is the alarming thing on television Stanis now. Stanisaros Banilausis wants a raise. Kill him. <laughs> it's like the old, you know, the old run, the old head of HBO goes... Can I just have a little mix of... Oh, no, damn it. it. Maim him. Yeah. Well, that's the thing now is that it, it is... There's no security. There's no security anymore because you can't throw your weight around like... No, I think it's great because Sean died in the very first series. Yeah. He? Yeah. I you mean, know, but that set the sort of template. You're killing off, you know, Ned in the very first series. The guy that you think is going to be your hero. They're like, oh, well, there's his head on the thing. But well, the two guys are great who do it. Because um, they'd never done a TV show before. They've never done a TV series. I mean, one's a novelist and the other one. And I think they um, they had the idea for the show, and I think they made it and then scrapped it and did it all again. Oh, wow. But the, the first pilot yeah. of Game of Thrones. Which was called Tits and Dragons. Which was called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was Dragons and Tits. Dragons so and Tits, yeah. And then they, right, they yeah. focus group that. It didn't like, very well. No, you know, tits, tits and first, Dragons Tits better. first, then the dragons. That's, that's Those true. are the order people like to see things in. Yeah. Yeah, a dragon. Oh, I thought this was going to be tit. Well, hang on. <laughs> All right, well, you should flip the. Okay, but I, the thing that's the thing that is uh, the thing that I love about that show is just the idea that they have this wonderful mechanism in, in place where you everyone has a goal. Like some shows, you know, they have to develop goals throughout the series, and or every year they have to solve whatever their problem is, and they solve, and then they come back the next year. But Game of Thrones, you know, everyone's trying to get to that throne. And that's it. And that that is a, that drives the story from any direction that you always have that to fall back on. And it looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. And the guy that I think is the real sort of not create. Well, he is creative genius. Yeah, because he's the guy that organizes the um, the shooting of it. Because you know they have two units constantly shooting, and they go back and forth. So his there's one guy. I forget his name. His producer is an English guy, and he's the one that works out. You know, they have one shoot. They have one shooting either in Spain or Croatia, wherever their location is, and one shooting permanently in Belfast. And it's how they interlock and have the actors going across and back and forth and interlocking. I think that's the genius of it. Yeah, how they make it work that way. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Manchester, mm -hmm. England. Stratford, actually, Stratford, the home of Manchester United, yeah, who my father played for. Yeah, that, this I, I so read. It's kind of nice when I go back to school, when I go back to Manchester because it's not Ian McShane, it's Harry's lad. Oh, that's oh, sweet. It's, yeah, it's great. I was there two weeks ago at the, the game at Old Trafford, so they all know me as you know Harry's kid. And you know, did you ever play? Bit. Yeah, I played, but I wasn't I wasn't good enough. I mean, I played with a couple of guys who were. Yeah, when I was like nine and ten and played early, and then I played with a couple of guys who were really went on to be pros. The difference at eight and nine at that level is, is enormous, you know, you know. And having grown up with it, my dad being a pro, you know when you're nine. I mean, I was not, I wasn't bad. I still love, I loved it until, I mean, I quit playing. I used to play here with Rod Stewart and all that lot. And they used to have, the, we used to have games in the 70s up at the Coldwater. Oh, that's amazing. Coldwater Fire Station, Coldwater Canyon Fire Station. We'd all be there playing. And then we used to play in Balboa Park when all the, all the when you get the real ethnics variety down there you get the venezuela all the south americans playing and all the europeans in darius teams we used to have them on balboa park yeah oh my god i had no idea so it's like a mini world cup basically mini world yeah. Cup, yeah yeah but it was good but uh, but you know it's um it's a great game i mean it, but the difference is between why it'll never catch on here is because it's kind of still tribal in england you know it's real tribal i mean it's really like you know every every team has their own every town has their own football team right I mean, it's not just that you have the Premier League. I mean, how many football teams do you have in this country? NFL, you don't have that many. I don't know. What are well, the there? country's so vast. You've got at least 100 teams in England in four, in four different divisions. The Premier League, the First Division, the Second Division, the Third Division, who are all supported crazily by people who live in their local towns. Oh, right. And travel 
up and down the country. But, I mean, that's why here you don't really get people traveling away to football games, you know. No. It's too vast anyway. Yeah, the country's too big. Too vast. <laughs> the country's, big. The country's, the country's big, really yeah. big. I'm always jealous of uh, comedians in uh, in the UK because they can basically just keep touring in a circle around a landmass the size of California. And here, when we tour here, it's like, you know, oh, you got to go, you know, you got to go to the East Coast, you know, okay, and they, that's a whole day to get there, you know, but you just hop on a train, you can just do shows all no, the way they around do, Absolutely, the and that, then there's, a, there's a, an enormous um, appetite for it, you know. But, I mean, there are those comics, you know, I love those comics who've never appeared on TV, which you have a lot of those in England, mainly before because they were too rude. Right, right. You know, blue, those comics you played in working man's clubs. Or right. now you've got comics like, I mean, the, like, a, what is it, the paid, one of the highest paid, he doesn't do TV, Russell Peters. Who's Russell a great, Peters, great right. comic. Yeah, yeah. But he never does TV. Yeah, it's great. It's kind of great in one It's way. great if you don't have to. It's really great if you don't have to, but in order to sustain that, you really do have to tour, like... Yeah, well, he does, non-stop. Non-stop. And plays those huge stadiums. I know. I, know. I mean, that's incredible. We don't have a well, lot Bill of... Hicks, who appeared on television 120 times, and they took him off 124 times, remember? Oh, yeah. Hicks used to go on... <laughs> well, he, would, he was purposely just trying to... He's a great guy. He was amazing. I mean, he was purposely just fucking with people and, you know... It just <laughs> he was huge in England. I mean, I'm sure he, he, was. he was. Oh yeah, that's where. Oh huge. That's where. There's also um, what's that? What's that great Rich Hall. Rich great Hall. Man. Yeah, Rich he, Hall. He plays there all the time. Rich, you know, he's a terrific comic. But you don't see him. I mean, they play. He's like a sort of a, a guest Englishman. You know. Mm -hmm. Then they do all those um, Edinburgh, Edinburgh, every year Edinburgh Festival. Yeah. Where all the comics from all over the world go. And yeah, because sometimes what you know, like shows. what can happen is if you tour in the states. And you're not necessarily as well known. You play for a lot of rooms where the the the, the tickets are free, and they're just yeah. trying to get people in there yeah. and to get drunk. And I think for some some comedians, they just don't feel like anyone's really listening to them. And there's so much comedy in such a concentrated area uh, over there that it's just it's just more appealing to kind of find your audience. And stick well, and you have a lot of comedy shows on TV too. You know, I mean, you have like Never Mind the Buzzcocks, yeah, which Jimmy. I'm sure you'd love. You yeah, know, you 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 do stand up, Chris. I do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I do. But I mean, you have a lot. But I mean, Never Mind the Buzzcocks. They have that thing with Q. QI with Q. Stephen, Stephen, which Fry. is a very funny show, and they have yeah. various. So there's a there's a lot of shows for new talent that comes up there, which which doesn't happen here so much. You know? No, we don't... Uh... They don't encourage that. I mean, you've got, like, Saturday Night Live, but that's a little... I mean, I was... Yes, they, they come up with some good stuff, but, you know, I mean, they should have retired a long time ago. I mean, the format... No, I mean, really. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, but it's great for young people coming in. Right. But it's, uh, it's sort of become a staple. But that's what you find with... Usually with American TV, actually, they just always go one season too far. <laughs> you know, one, just one too many. Well, that's the money part. That's, that's the money that is the, Absolutely. This yeah. is the money part. Yeah, it's just like, but it's, sometimes it's, you want to go, no, just, you know. I th and sometimes that does happen where they'll, you know, a show. Like Breaking Bad is a perfect example of them going, nope, it's five seasons. That was good. That, that's a great show. And it's a great show. But but what does happen is, you know, you get to. Well, network, that's season. network when that's they network. say we, we will need. And thank God that, you know, cable shows have made the sort of right of the king, which yeah. is, if you like. Like Milch. Mm -hmm. Like the guy, Vince, the guy from. Vince um, Gilligan. Vince Gilligan. Yeah, yeah. Terrific. Like that show which I watched, started watching the other day, which I'd never seen, which I was iRobot, which, Jesus, what a good show. Yeah. I mean, no, the whole concept. Not you mean just, Mr. Robot? Mr. Sorry, Mr. Yeah, Robot. Mr. Yeah, yeah Robot. Yeah. 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 yeah, Mr. Robot. No, it's a tremendous. Yeah. I mean, well-conceived, beautifully shot, constructed. I mean, really interesting. I'd never seen it. You go, well, there's another one I've got to watch. You know? Yeah. And you just go through them and through them. You, well, you know, HBO, I think, was largely, in, in America anyway, HBO was largely responsible for, because cable used to be a joke. If you were on a cable show in this country in like well, the no, 80s. Because, well, no, but I remember we came across in, when we did Lovejoy, and we were nominated for, is it like the, it used to be the Ace Awards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they? the Cable Ace Awards, I remember, yeah. In 92, and we all came across, and we were nominated for best sort of international show, Lovejoy, and we came across, Alan and I, and um, and we all sat in some, and it was this, the Ace Cable Awards, <laughs> some downtown, because <laughs> it was the big earthquake. Right. That's like 94. Yeah, 94, Ridgewood. January 94. That we yeah. all came out for that, yeah. And it was scary. But, scary they, but, they, but cable was able to say, hey, you know what, guys? We can't pay you as much money, but... We'll give you the freedom. We'll give you the freedom, and it's not going to be this large committee. It'll just be a couple of us kind of making the decisions. We'll keep it simple. And, you know, 
And guess what happens when you let really smart, creative people carry out their vision without a million uh, notes and too much, you know, too much futzing around with it? You get really good stuff. You know, you get really, really, really no, good you stuff. you really do. You really – I mean, I've met the guy on um, Mr. Robot. Sam. I mean, yes, Sam. Phenomenal. I mean, he did – I mean, I was watching – I thought, I'll, I'll, you know, you want to go – I was watching. I thought, yeah, I'll watch a couple of episodes. So you're into it before you know it. You've watched, four, yeah. The like I did with Breaking Bad because yeah. I was never here. I was always working away. Yeah. And I remember it was two, it was three. Yeah, it was when we did um, the man, the Hollow Point. I was waiting the Hollow Point when I when we was doing that. I finished it and I came back to LA. I couldn't go to England for two weeks. Gwen was there, and I was at the beach and I started watching Breaking. I thought I've never seen it. Let me and deliberately. I thought I'll save it. And I watched all five episodes, uh, five years in like a week. Yeah. I said it was great. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the, and now they just stream it. I mean, they didn't even have streaming then. No. Like they do now. No. It's like when the body call will come out next year, American Gods. I mean, that's going out Very on stars. Very excited about that. Do you, were you a fan of the book? Yeah, well, and I, you know, I know Neil. You know Neil? I do yeah. know Neil. Oh, you do? Yeah, and, uh, and that's He's what, amazing. I mean, he's incredible. one of those guys. Incredible. One of those, I mean, when we did comedy, you know, you don't realize what a, he's sort of, he's a god to yeah. most people. Yeah. Well, I did Coraline, that movie. You know, I know, the book, Yeah, I know. the voiceover for that. But this is, I mean, he's sort of very varied and very, and very prolific, too. Coraline's I mean, one of my favorite animated. As I thought it was beautifully done, didn't you? I really Cor- thought Cor- Henry did a great job. Hodgman's in that. Yeah. Like, it's such a great... Oh, Hodgman, yeah, John. Yeah. 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 It was very funny. It's such a great... I- it's just such a beautiful little movie. You know, such a beautiful movie. And he used 3D beautifully. Be- gorgeous. You know, that's the art of doing 3D, you know. As opposed to when we did Pirates of the Caribbean, when, you know, all the cameramen, I loved it, Darish, Derek, Darish Wolski, who hated it, say, okay, get the fucking red box out, you know. <laughs> okay, put the sword out. They really hate doing 3D, you know. It's for the sake of it. Get the fucking shot for the fucking red box. Get the sword going to the audience like that. But, you know, Henry in, in Coraline had thought about and all the flowers, you know. I mean, yes. he's the case, so you have that whole concept. But most people it's just like saying, oh, now, now's when we all go, Ugh! in the audience. You know, and the audience goes, Whoa! and rolls back. But nobody really gives anyone a fuck. do that in a 3D audience ever. <laughs> There's a sword coming into the... No, it's okay. It's, it's still pretend. Pretend. 3D. Yeah, oh, these glasses. What did I... I mean, it's such a strange... Oh. But it might... Oh, when we did the... Oh, that was it. When we did the premiere in the, in the, in the Cannes Festival. And, you know, the audience, when you, you will not, in French, well, you have it on your uh, 3D glasses. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine you know, all those French, told to wear glasses, told to do anything. At the night, they were like, <laughs> I refuse to <laughs> This movie is blurry. Movie. Yeah, you got to put the glasses on. <laughs> you cannot tell me. <laughs> it's, blue. it's one of those. It's just one of those. Another one done in, like, 143 seconds, at whatever, Billy Lynn, Billy Lynn's full-time walk. <laughs> what is it? He's done it? What has he done that in? 17,000 frames? Is that why the Star Wars movie didn't look good? What was all that? Remember they did? Well, were they, were they, they overshoot? Were they, yeah. they overshoot whatever or yeah, something seen in IMAX, whatever? I don't know, but sometimes, you know, when the movies are too 3D or too immersive, or too, I just get motion sick. Well, you, well, I think it happens a lot. I mean, I remember when we were doing Hollow Point and I went for a, well, a Sunday, we had a Sunday off and I went to the local... Sort of, I might went to the, as you do on yeah. Sundays in, in Middle America. You go to the mall, right? You know, or you yeah. Go picture to, you going to a mall in the middle of America, putting you go, on your or ice you go skates. To the mall and you look at this and going you know, to Hot Topic <laughs> and you know buying some pop culture T-shirts. Or as Murray Roman used to say, you know, you go to the library, you look at the book, and it says. <laughs> He came. They saw he was Jewish, and they killed him. That's the end of the. Then you go to the. Then you go to. Then you go to the movies. And I was. You know, and Spider Man was playing in twelve of the. Yeah. Twelve of the mm-hmm. things. Yeah. So when I remember sitting there, and I couldn't, I couldn't take the noise after two. Right. Whether it's age too, man. But but it was it was the noisiest, loudest, and you just go, what the fuck am I? You know. Well, nothing. you know, I think part of it now too is just the idea of. I mean, people don't need to leave their houses for much anymore. So how do you get people so you they get them the by spectacle? doing? Yeah, exactly. Well, look, it's his three. I mean, three D really isn't. I, it's there are very. I, I can only think of maybe a couple movies where I thought, oh well, they actually really that w- that was very well woven into the story. That, well, that's what I mean. If it's if it comes together as a whole, I'll be interested to see this because Ang Lee is a terrific filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, the guy has really made some great movies. So it'll be worth seeing what what he's actually done. Yeah. This movie. Because he took a chance on 
What was his name? But he did Hidden Crouching Dragon, didn't he? Yeah, Crouching Hidden Dragon, which is yeah. great. Beautiful. So it'll be worth seeing what he's done. Anyway. So, so basically what you're saying is the Deadwood movie should be in 3D, right? Oh, no. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't even go. Oh, back to Deadwood. Wouldn't it be nice to be, wouldn't it be nice if they just said, yeah, go and make it. You know, get the two hours. Everybody will be happy. Everybody's satisfied. Put on the glasses, and we can Al's. finish it. Al's glasses, can yeah. you imagine? Yeah. 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 Get the gimp, and then the mop comes into the audience. Whoa! No, they're putting that thing down my dick. Which is the thing. They're, they're <laughs> oh my god! They're pulling out the stones. Oh, you know the no. stones. I don't think exactly. there was. I don't think there was a male who had a pulse that watched that and didn't like yeah, go no, up on okay, your tiptoes. A little bit of whoa when you went on. Your, I know. <laughs> no, whoa! Have you ever yeah. had? Have you ever had kidney stones? Before? Oh yeah. Oh, you have. It's like being, I had one when I was like, yeah, God, it was. I mean, it is like being. Kicked in the balls by a you know a, a thirty you know a three hundred and fifty pound linebacker. Oh my god! No, it, it's a weird feeling, and then of course you pass it, and you don't even know you've had it. I pa- but I had the one. I know of a friend of mine who makes them. You know, <laughs> they do. People make them. So I just say stop drinking red wine. You know, because that's gravel. It's like people do. They have it's a regular occurrence, but it's a terrible thing. Kidney stones. Ooh. Yeah, I know. I know. My wife. Now is they zap them. them. They just zap yeah. them out and break yeah. them down. Yeah. 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 Uh, was there? Do you think there was any uh, when you when you realized at nine years old? Well, I'm probably not going to be a football player. Like, do, was your was your dad cool with that when you're like? I think oh, I- my dad was the greatest guy ever. He was great. He was fantastic. I mean, I never had a row with him. He was a really, he's a really terrific human being. Um, and he coached when he gave up football. He had a job because in those days, you know, in the fifties, I mean, it wasn't you know he had a he had a full time job. When he left football, he was scouted. He stayed in the Manchester area, and he stayed on as um, he worked for a company called Massey Ferguson as uh, personnel. You know, called human resources. You mm-hmm. call it. And he stayed at United training, and he used to train them. Um, he used to go like coach kids in school soccer. Yeah. So, but he no, my dad wasn't this kind of forceful guy. No, he wasn't like you have to do this. You and he, he knew he knew he wasn't going to push me into something that I was. And if you're not as good as your dad, my dad was a pro. You know, I mean, you're going to you know. I don't think talent is genetic. You know, in those forms, some of it is. It can be physically sometimes, but I don't think like acting doesn't run in our family. You know, my mother's not, my father, and I certainly didn't when I was like. It wasn't like the alternative to football. I didn't start making little, you know, making little theatres <laughs> like a lot of actors do when they say, "I was at a yen, you know, I, I built my little theatres and cut out little people and read." I said, "No, no, no, I didn't do that. I just like playing sports. Played everything. Went out regular kid." When they just had one teacher at school who used to look, who did the school play, and he wasn't like the English teacher. He was a guy called Leslie Ryder, and he put on a play. And uh, but I was always the kid in my class, like from eleven, twelve years old, who they had to read something out. He'd say, "You read this out," because for some reason I could make sense of like sight reading mm-hmm. instantly. And I must say, when I first did the play, I sort of got on the stage. And I thought, "Oh, this is coming. Yeah, you know, it's like you know what you're doing." I felt very comfortable. Yeah, uncomfortable but comfortable. Right, like you know what you know you know what this is about, and that's it. So we did a couple of plays, and the, I think the following year he did. Uh, he said, "Yeah, we, we're going to do um, Cyrano de Bergerac next year, and you're going to play Cyrano." I said, "Fine, you know whatever, sir. Can I go and play football now?" Yeah, carried on. Then we did it, and then he came to my parents and said. Um, do you, do you do you realize your son's not bad at this? Have you thought of it as a profession? I certainly hadn't. And he said, maybe we should apply for drama school. So then and I thought there was one, the Royal Academy. So I went down with my, my mom and we, I auditioned and then they came back and they said, yeah, we'll accept you. So I went back the following year and I was there for a year and a half and then my best friend at drama school was Johnny Hurt, who was a term ahead of me, John. And John was doing leaving to do this movie called The Wild and the Willing and they couldn't find the lead, which was a 19-year-old stroppy sort of university kid from the north so <laughs> they sort of he said i think you could play this and the same agent who had him said yes yeah. so i went out on a a green line bus to, very romantic in those days you go to like coming to a studio here and they said i mean they said yeah we'd love to. i met them and they said we'd love to audition you can you get yourself out to pine would have been off me a car <laughs> got out on a bus and i came back and we did the audition with a, an actress who was in the film called virginia maskell who was a big star at the time lovely woman Went back to drama school in the afternoon, said I'd been to the dentist, lied. Nice. And the following day, they phoned up and said, you got the part. So I had to go to my teacher and say, you know, sir, I lied. I didn't go to the dentist. I went to do a film test. And he said, well, we might not give you your 
certificate that says you can act. I mean, have you ever a certificate that says you can act? <laughs> How about a check? No, no, that, I've had a check. Say, yeah. That's, that's a check. Exactly. kind of a hey, certificate. I'm going to get a check set. Thank yeah. you. So that was it. And I went off, and that's, you know, that was, that was what? My goodness, that was 50, 1962. Oh, wow. And since then. So we've been doing it since then. When uh, Jeremy Irons was on just a few weeks ago, actually, and he told the story about John Hurt, that John Hurt would fuck with young actors by making them very aware of their their whatever their tool sets were like oh it's very i love the way you do this with your voice you know to just like make them so aware that it kind of like you know i think that sounds like a jeremy story to me does that I mean, he, yeah does I he know. like to tell i think does, it's jeremy that does that rather you, than <laughs> going, and he just puts it off on other he's people putting scarves around the room yeah <laughs> <laughs> i did notice the room got a lot scarfier a baby scarf, yeah, yeah jeremy yeah. Was, where did all these scarves come like i turned around for a second and it just <laughs> draped just everywhere like, it was just like a, a rainstorm of scarves no john's great john johnny and i've been friends forever I mean, it was it's very funny because he got his uh, he got his knighthood last year he oh he that. did yes, yes. so john so Joe, they finally got that. Do you have to tease him about? Do you tease him well, about that, or is it? Fuck me! Of course you do. Dear <laughs> God, I mean, I mean, can you imagine? I said, now you got you can you can now Sir you now Sir John Hurt along with all those other sirs like Sir Patrick Stewart, yes, Sir Lenny Henry. <laughs> fuck me! What exalted company you're in now, darling? Yeah. <laughs> no, it is one of those funny things, you know, when knighthoods mean. No, the funny thing is, my agent said to me, and they said, we had the same agent, John, uh, who's a well-known English character, who said. Um, darling, I think we may, we, may, we may try to push for a knighthood. I said, come on, I'm not the kind of guy. He said, well, you do get a little bit more money. Not much, but a, li- a little bit more. There's a sir in front of you. <laughs> it just gets a little bit. Just a little bit more. But does it, do, do you get anything else? Do you get special no, privileges no, anywhere? No, do you get to go to a, a, some kind of stonecutters meeting? Or what, do you, exactly. what do you get? No, no. No, it's nothing like that. But of course, uh, if the if England is ever attacked by a dragon, you are all called to arms. I'll put the tits on and I'll be there. <laughs> Would you want that? I mean, do you know is no. that is that are you going to be knighted at some point? No, I don't think I'm the kind of guy. I'm not. I don't fit. No, I'm not. I'm not that. I'm not that kind of person. I don't fit into that sort of area. And I'd. Um, no, it doesn't appeal to me. I'd say no. Serene is applying the stain stick to his laundry. <laughs> Serene. Serene. Well, Serene, well, they got some McAllen, you know. You don't go for Serene. Oh, that Serene. Yeah, the yeah. other Serene. Uh, Serena. 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 Yeah. Serene. There's another, so, no, there, okay. is, there is another Serene no, already. There's a, no, there's loads. Of, no, it's, became, it's a funny, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing. Some, some, some treated, Johnny treated it like, no, it's, it's funny. I mean, Johnny, Johnny Hurt was just, um, I mean, it was kind of like his Jew. He'd been around a long time, like me. But, it's, but you know, people like uh, Ben Kingsley, mm-hmm. who insists on being called sir, mm-hmm. you know, which is a bit of an odd one, you know. <laughs> As somebody once said, there's a great story from a great comic called, um, English comic called Kenny Lynch, who once played golf. With, and it was Sean Connery, who's an old friend of mine. Sean and the King, King Constantine of Greece. Mm-hmm. And they were playing golf at went with the famous story. And, uh, and before they started, Kenny said, he was a very funny, a funny guy. He said, well, so what should I call you? Um, your, your, your highness, your, uh, what, your, your king? What it? And he said, this is, this is the exiled king of Greece at the time. Yes, call me king. And Kenny, quick as a flash, said, well, I'll tell you what, the game comes down to a four-foot part on the last hold. I'll call you a lucky gun like I call everybody else. How's that? <laughs> your majesty? <laughs> <laughs> so it's. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, can you, yeah, call me King. King? Can you, yes. Sounds like a dog. Come over here, King. King. Go over. Get over here. <laughs> Sit. No, it's a very big. Don't forget, there's a lot of stuff in England about, you know, there, there is a lot of. Uh, my mother, I'm sure, would love me. I should love it if it was a sir. If it, she'd love it if I, they said, you know, arise, you know. Well, the people go, oh, no, oh, Mr. Mr. McShane is still Mr. Not Said. But I, they, she'd love it. But I'm not sure. It just doesn't sit well with me. It right. just doesn't sit well with a lot. Of, I mean, Finney turned it down. I think Albert turned it down three or four times. Lots of people have. Just because it, it's too doesn't much. doesn't fit with you. Right. Well, it's too much. Like, and what does it mean? It means you're part of them now. Yeah. You know, as a part of what you've been trying to avoid your entire life, being part of that lot. You know? And do you feel like that gives you less freedom in a weird yeah, sort of way? Yeah, it gives you less sort of, well, a lot of people use it and do it. But I, mean, I could, but I understand why a lot of people take it 
as a as a badge of honor, which is fine. But I think all those awards are always given out like, um, you know, they should be given to people, lollipop people, people who do good work in the community sure. or take care of stuff. And, and as somebody said, you know, it's not politicians for fuck's sake, you know, because anybody, Billy Connolly once said a great thing. He said, you know, anybody who runs for public office should be immediately be disqualified by running. <laughs> right, 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 right. It should, you know, you should be a, like you. We should pick somebody. You, look, look, when you have a group of people, you know who's the guy that should represent you. Doesn't mean he's the smartest. Doesn't mean he's the most talented. There's something about certain people that fits certain roles right and usually if you're a group of smart people you'll say no he's the one that can represent us i'm the one that can play devil's advocate you're the one that can do that and you find groups when somebody uses it i it's like that i want to you know i want to lay i want to be the the one at school always said um i want i'll be in charge of uh, you know i'm in charge of lunch right I'll give you, I'll be, whatever you want you know well but you seem pretty i mean and i imagine you've been this way always always but you seem pretty centered and pretty you kind of know what you want you seem to know who you are like you there's no sense about you of you know i'm a tortured artist and i was like no, yeah you know no, no, get no. this job i'll do this job no 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 I, I think when i got sober i was remember what um how many years oh it's coming up now god it's uh 29 years in january fantastic congrats 13. yeah thank you hmm? 13. 13 i have 13, 13 good yeah god bless yeah, yeah. the 20 no, it's phenomenal. good to see the 29 it's good to see the 29 phenomenal yeah i don't know we're here this morning i used to i passed i was early and i probably made the car stop at the old place of cold coffee shop i used to see people getting so back in 29 years ago so i went in there and had a had a breakfast it was kind of nice oh that is nice it's kind of like a solo meeting on your own <laughs> <laughs> kind of good um where were we? What was, what was I was it? asking you about the, the being centered thing. You said when you got sober, that was very helpful for you. you know, oh, yeah. You yeah. Sober. I mean, that, that was, and I always remember, it's the lines of, it's, um, it's what do you call it? It's Flower Bear. Flower Bear's a great line, which a lot of people quote. I know, but it's true. When he said, you know, if you, if you really, I, I knew when it, like 15 years into my career, like about 10 years in, timing was all wrong. Something was wrong, so I decided to have a fucking good time <laughs> for the next fifteen years until it felt right. <laughs> right. Until it felt right. But it's true. I did time. You feel no. It's, the parts of you know you get. I was always very high functioning. You know, I could always work. You know, I was got well paid, took care of stuff. But it was like I was just no. I thought I'll have a good time, and then when I met the love of my life, my wife now Gwen, and then I you know, and after about six years, I got proper sober, and then it was like, yeah. And then I remember the flower quote, which is, you know, live your life like a middle-class bourgeoisie and put all craziness into what you do for a living. And if we're lucky enough to do this, like what you do or what I do, which is, you know, basically fuck about to somebody else for most of your life and you get paid very well for it, then pour everything into that and then lead your life quietly. And it actually it's worked out pretty well. That's fantastic. How do you – I do have a, I do have an alcoholic brain question for you, though. Yeah. Which is – because a lot of people, I get notes from people and they go, well, how do I start the process? Or how do I? And I always say, well, you know, just get, get a support structure, whatever your support structure is. Find a meaning, find a therapist, find, a spot, find someone who can help guide you through this process. But it didn't occur to me until about 12 years in that, you know, of course, stopping the thing doesn't just solve the problem. It just sort of clears the table so that you can start to figure out what the problem is. But I am re- – I find it very interesting – that I've started to identify things about my brain where I go, oh, you're just trying to create drama because you're looking for some sort of an emotional spike that drinking used to give you. So how do you, how do you kind of fight all of the, the other trappings of what that, what that is? How do you sort of push that stuff away and stay centered and stay focused and not, not let that stuff take over? I think I was given the best advice when I first started, which was, um, don't, you know, go to meetings and don't question anything too much if you can. And be nice to yourself. If you get agitated, don't put, you, don't put yourself in positions to agitate yourself. So now, whatever, or what, you take a hot bath, or you do put scarves around the room, <laughs> or you light a few candles, and you put yourself in a position that denotes a sort of relaxed attitude instead of, you know, ga- or, or put a nice, or put some classical music on. Don't play rock and roll for a while. Play something else. Put yourself in surroundings that are comfortable for you. Put a dressing gown on. Don't wear your tight, skinny jeans all day. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's like all those silly th- things which sound silly, which, which actually do help. Yeah. 
or read something. Don't read. Don't do that for them. Read something else. Read something natural. Don't watch the news late at night. Oh my God. No, really. But that, that's enough to get you going. You know. Yeah. All the all those kind of obvious things, and also don't question too much. And I think one of the main reasons why I got lucky um, is the fact that. Um, when somebody said, how did you get sober? I remember after like six, like nine months or a year, got sober. So how did you do it? I said, I have no idea. I just did what they said. I went to a few as many meetings as I could, right? I didn't drink. I surrounded myself with what I considered was, you know, I didn't, I didn't go out with my, put myself in positions or places which were awkward. And, um... It's tough. I got lucky. I mean, I, I think, you know, I really, I really, at the end of the year, sort of thought, wow. Also, you look in the mirror and you think, oh, my eye's gone back in. You know, yeah. <laughs> look at that. I've got two eyes. I've not got a eye. In. You know, all those things. That, and you suddenly feel better. Yeah. Um, and it's tough because I know a friend of mine, the only, one of the few people I've known in my life that, you know, I couldn't help was that uh, died, died of this disease two years ago. Close and nothing, nothing to do, and, and nothing I could do about it. The only time in my life, and this person who I loved dearly as a friend, and would ask me, what, and I'd say I was too close to it, but I'd always say something, and they could not get the message. They hated AA, they hated it, and it really struck home. I thought some people never get it, never get the message, and it's tragic. They're looking for too much in it. So that I always say, you know, being so, it's a simple, it's a simple program. It's not. It's not easy, but it is a simple thing. Right. And the, the benefits just come to you more and more and more. But too much is made of it now, and too many people talk about all that. I, we've, I've talked too much about it now, because, you know, the, the anonymity thing is a good thing. Well, it doesn't exist anymore in the, when, when I got sober, but... Um, I'm very grateful. But it is helpful for people, especially... Oh, because, I think it is, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's helpful yeah. for people yeah. to hear it, because, yeah. you know, one of the reasons why... I, I do bring it up I, consistently on the podcast. And the reason do, that yeah. I – well, I do yeah. because I feel like any moment, you know, there, there's – I know there's someone out there who, even if it's one person, they just hear the right thing and the light goes on and they go, oh, my God. Oh, no. This is the thing that speaks to me. I guess this is the thing that I was waiting for, but now it makes sense. And now I'm going to do something about it. And so, I, you know, I, I probably talk about it too much, but I just feel like – it's helpful for people to hear everyone's path or everyone's relationship to it because they I know that there's a percentage of people who go, Oh my God, you know, Ian said this or Chris said this and that and that spoke to me and so then I changed you know, then I yeah. was able to take those steps. So that's yeah. why that's why yeah. I bring it up. It's not yeah. to be disrespectful or try to, no, you know, no, no, like no, no. I gotcha, I'm talking to you know. It's really just for people that I know, you know, need help. What'd you say? Oh no. I was just taking off the microphone. Oh, okay. I thought you said, Hey, no, no, no. you okay? <laughs> yeah. What'd you do? Well, you should have those headphones on all the time. You need to get outside once in a while. Katie's the most outdoor sportsy person ever. And she's, we force her to sit in here, you know, week after week and listen to these podcasts. But uh, Hollow Point comes out December 16th. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was looking at the trailer on YouTube, and it has a shit ton of views. And people seem to be very excited about it. And well, you're great. And Patrick Wilson's amazing. Patrick's good. John Leguizamo's terrific. Um, Jim Belushi's great in it. Um, and we, but we do have a very talented Spanish director, Gonzalo Lopez Gallego, who did them, done a couple of movies before. And I think... This is um, he's a gem to work with, and we're planning on doing another movie in a, a next year, set in the Canary Islands. Which, oh. uh, but he's a great director. He's a terrific director, and I, I saw it last year at the uh, the Cabo Cabo San Lucas Film Film Festival. The Cabo sounds funny. What an excuse to go down to Cabo San Lucas and have a film festival. <laughs> but um, but it was I saw it down there. <laughs> yes, I'll stay at Los Angeles for four days. And <laughs> Well, if I must, if I'm uh, anything, somebody's got to do it. Anything for the craft. Yep, absolutely. But it, no, it's a really good. My wife hasn't seen it. She loved it, which I'm. She's a pretty good judge. And it's a very, it's a, it's a good modern, modern day sort of film western noir. Yeah, yeah, with how, a good storyline and uh, yeah, it's good. How do you know when you? What do you, what do you feel when you've done when you're proud of your work? Like, oh, I what, think you know when you're doing it. It's any good. I mean, I've done loads of films I haven't seen. But right. you never know how something's going to turn out. Like, no, you don't. Know, but you've got a pretty good idea. You've got you've got a good idea mostly about how, especially on movies. 
TV shows, not so much because they're complicated. I mean, American Gods is a complicated thing because we've got a lot of uh, there's a lot of special effects in it, Chris, which <laughs> they're doing now, and there's a lot of and it, there's animation in it, and the special effects, and it's a it's a it's a, you know it sounds like a um, a great idea. It's it's difficult because you're creating like anything with the, these kind of shows, which are futuristic, come under that fabulous fabulous mm-hmm. fantasy kind of heading. Um, you don't want them to be too twee. You don't want them to be too, uh, you know, set in the present day. And finding the tone is hugely important, finding sure. the tone and the look. So I hope they find, I think they found a look for it. Mm-hmm. And the tone will be whatever. I mean, with, there's eight episodes and they're very varied. They're very different. Kid Ricky Whittle's great, the kid who plays Shadow Moon. He's a terrific kid to work with. We have a good rapport. And um, very good, terrific showrunner. So I worked with before Michael Green. I did Kings with him. Oh, okay. Well, Kings is you, Kings is a classic example of one of those shows that you know a network says we want to do a cable show. Then you do one for them, and then they go. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you can't say well, that. Can't, I can't do this. And they they say we're putting you out of Saturday night at ten o'clock, and you say thank you very much. <laughs> the death knell for any drama. Saturday night at ten o'clock. People GNBC, love thank you. staying home oh, on the weekends to watch. Wait to see it. Complicated dramas. They love it. They love it. Do you want to go out or should we stay in? Let's stay home and watch that new What's It Called? Yeah. <laughs> King, here, Kings. Here, Kings. Here, Kings. Here, Kings. Here, Kings. Here, Something. Yeah, it is. It's so funny. So, that- but it was true. But you know, they were all high on it. And of course, you know, and especially when you're into like episode, it's episode six and you've met all Ben Silverman and Catherine Pope and they go, suddenly they go, a little bit of news today. Yeah, they've all been fired. The people that, <laughs> the, the people that promoted the show and you go, well, the ones coming in are going to be really fucking behind this one. They're so because what I know Whoa. about network is that when people come in, they love to support the projects that they weren't involved oh, with. They go, "We're very much looking forward to your movie next year, and looking putting all our weight behind it." Oh my so God. we're putting you out on Saturday night at ten o'clock. Yeah, and they go, "It didn't perform very well." Did you tell no. anyone about it? No, <laughs> no, not one commercial. Nah, fuck everyone. Well, you know, it's like you. Wa- I remember watching a nature. I was watching a nature show once where it's the you know a new a new head of the lion pride has come in. The new male he's defeated the reigning male comes in and then just and gruesomely just you know starts killing all of the young just walking around and breaking their necks and you're like that's yeah, that's network that's television, network television. Yeah, a new exec comes in and breaks all the necks of the uh, all the that's shows that are already do. there you know but in the end of the, at the end of the day do you just sort of feel like well you know i got to work and it was fine well yeah and, that's you know, what i meant you got to work in and it's you know it's on, it's on dvd it's like it lies forever in the dvd hall of fame you know whatever mm-hmm. but um a michael green did that and uh, Brian Fuller, yep. the very gifted Brian Fuller from, um, you know, uh, what was it show called? Pushing Daisies yep. and uh, Hannibal. Brian's very gifted. So the two of them are really interesting pair together. They write quite differently, but I mean, together they're inventive. And I always thought when I read the book, Guyman, who was around, and Neil's on it as executive producer, that actually the book is like, it's like a blueprint for TV series. You remember it at all? I don't know, but you know it's like because it, he leaves a lot out. He just leaves it open there. As how do you do the TV show? And it's, it's the book because he leaves so many sort of areas uncovered. He jumps around, then he has separate stories come into it. It's a very in- strange book, American Gods. A lot of people love it. You know, they're obsessed by it. And um, I think we get we um, we end we end the uh, series, the first series. Assuming there might, <laughs> might be a second season. You never know, Chris. You, just you don't absolutely know. Absolutely you never don't know. Even know. And you, you know that stars wanted to be huge and Fremantle wanted to of be huge. Of course they do. But you never know. Right. Um, but I know we ended at a, a point which, you know, is a very good point, a very good area where you just know, actually, you get to know what the show is about. Not sort of halfway through before the, they all meet at the, uh, the House on the Rock. Mm hmm. Whatever. So the House on the Rock, for those who know, you know what I'm talking about? House on the Rock, that'll be the second year. Great. If there's a second year. Yeah, you just, you just, you just hope that when you're working on something, some, some executive doesn't come in and go, this is going to be huge. Like, God damn it, <laughs> why would you say, say that? that? But they always say that. They always this say that. This is going to be great you just, and you're going to be You just great. never know. What percentage of your year do you, devo- do you like to work and have off? This year's been a, a, a long one. I mean, I did a... Um, I finished off last this time last year. We finished off John Wick Two, which yep. comes out in January. Then I went and did uh, this this rather charming movie with um, Michael Shannon oh. and uh, Ron Perlman called Pottersville, which is a sort of like a 
It's kind of like an It's a Wonderful Life, like a, a, a charming American story, which we did in January in upstate New York. That'll be out next year. And then I went to England, did a boxing movie with Ray Winston, me, and a guy called Johnny Harris, who wrote it. Again, Johnny is sober like five years, and this is about a boxer who's gone down, slid down the way, and comes back. And this is that's one of the reasons I did it, because it, it, it's about the meetings, it's about the... It's about the our thing, as my mother-in-law used to say, you're, you're, that thing you're in. <laughs> <laughs> my mother-in-law used to say, that thing you're in. I said, yeah, but this is, it's about that. And <laughs> How's that thing you're in? Well, How's that thing? Know, it's going pretty well. Good, good. Yeah, 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 I think I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. I'm stick with it. It's going to be and, a real uh, thing. And then I went off and did, uh, oh, and i got a thing coming out with Dre as well, Dr. Dre. Nice. Yeah, Vital Signs will be coming out on uh, on iTunes. Me, uh, that'll, be, that'll be me, Sam Rockwell, and Michael... Michael K. Williams Mm -hmm. playing Dre's um, inside his head, but actually we actually appear with him. But I play Vengeance, Sam plays Ego, and Michael plays um, Negativity. (laughs) And it's all about Dre's early... It's about Dre... It's going to come out on... I think it's Beats TV, which is Apple's first kind of attempt at streaming. Yeah. Doing drugs. So it's a little... It's like hip-hop inside beautiful. out. It sounds yeah, like hip-hop yeah, inside out. Yeah, it's kind of story of his life. It's like, you know, now I'm this billionaire guy who's out of Compton. Can I trust anybody anymore? Or yeah. What goes on in actual life? Because that'll be interesting. And what do you do with your free time when you have free time? I don't... I read a lot. I read. I read. I love watching... Um, I love watching TV. Watch a lot of shows. Um, play a lot of music. Uh, travel a lot. My mother's 95 in England, so I'll oh, go back and wow. see her. Yeah, she'll go back and see mom two, three times a year. That's great. And my wife's mother is also alive. She's 96, so that's where she is now in Detroit with her. And, um, and my, my, my kids and my grandkids are in London, so I'll go and see them. Just came back from them, five weeks with in London, sort of seeing them all before they have their holidays and all yeah. that. And, um, yeah, busy, and I like to work. I, I enjoy what I do, you know. I really, really do. And that's part of my, uh, as I said, when you, we don't, when I got sober, and when you know, said, yeah, this is what you're meant to do, and make the most of it. And there's some fascinating projects, and um, some work out, some don't. <laughs> but America, I'm looking forward to them all, actually. Yeah. But I mean, Hollow Point is a really, because we tried to make it for about two years, and either um, with Gonzalo, and then it was sort of I was going to do it with Tim. Tim, uh, Tim Oliphant from Deadwood, and, yep. Tim would, and I couldn't do it, so Tim was doing it on his own, and then you know how things do, they slide, right. they were going to make it in Colombia, then they couldn't make it, in, it all fell through, and it came together last year with me and Patrick, so we, I mean, yeah, two years ago, 2014. Well, okay, so that comes out December 16th, uh, yep. and I mean, I, you, you're one of those guys that whenever you're on screen, it's, you know, it's, and the other guy like that is Michael Shannon. So to hear that you guys are in a thing together. Yeah, Michael's good. Yeah, he's a good just, lad. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're, you guys have that thing where it's, so whenever you're on screen, like, I want to watch that guy. Like, I want to know what that guy has to say, you know, and, it, and, it, and I, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm sure a lot of it is hard work and t- talent and doing all that stuff. But I, but I do think there is kind of a, cause Michael's a very, Kind yeah, of a sense, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, but there is something about it, there's just an authentic grounding thing that some people just have, and I'm fascinated by it, and I want to steal it. Uh, I no, just, James Cagney said it. You know, I, I mean, he was asked for advice. He said, "Plant your feet, look the other guy in the eyes, say your lines, and try not to fall over the furniture." <laughs> and if you do that, it's a good start. Yeah, you know, be honest. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for asking me. Please, oh my God, I was I was beyond, you know, when Deb, our booker, was like, I think Ian McShane. I was like, Are you fucking kidding me? You know, because I just no, it's good. It, it it, I'm always still delighted when anyone wants to sit down and chat for an hour. You know, because it can be a lot to ask of someone. If someone's like, Really, I got to talk to them for no, an hour. No, I like the format. You see, and I also like radio. I find it more easy than with a, than on T. You know, because on TV you're forced to sort of. I never. That's a difficult format. I remember I did the. The Jay Leno show once. It was like, you know, coming on after Chris Rock, and you go, what the fuck am I supposed to do? <laughs> and I love Chris. Chris and I had, had a great chat, but you go, you know, he's sitting next to you going, bah, 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 and you go, what, what am I going to come on and tell a joke? I mean, what is it? You know, you're an actor from England. You go on, hello, how are you? Yes, I mean, what do you do? I'm an actor, you know. I have many stories to tell you. Yes, Mr. Rock. Well, tell one of them, English man, you know what it is. <laughs> but it's a very difficult format, that's it. And now, especially because everybody's like, it's all become like, Nobody, I mean, Carson was the master of that, but it's all changed. It's now, it's sort of games. It's all, it's, so this format of like being over, it's a much easier sort of thing. You go back and forth and you chat and you can be profane and you can be, 
bit off color and you can have a good time. And I appreciate it. I enjoyed talking to you, Mr. Hardwick. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mc- Sir, Sir McShane. Syrian. 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 <laughs> how do you get your laundry so fluffy and white? <laughs> Syrian. Clorox. Oh, delightful. <laughs> I must write that down. And Downy. Clorox and Downy. Clorox and Downy. <laughs> Ian McShane, thank you so much for being here. Uh, would you mind taking us out in a classic Al Swearingen style, please? Hey, enjoy your fucking burrito, you nerdy cocksuckers. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. down the way and comes back and this is that's one of the reasons i did it because it, it it's about the meetings it's about the it's about the our thing as my mother-in-law she said you're yeah that thing you're in <laughs> <laughs> my mother-in-law used to say that thing you're in i said yeah well this is it's about that and you're... <laughs> how's that thing you're in well how's that thing? Know, it's going pretty well good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah i think we're gonna stick with yeah. it we're stick with it. it's gonna be and, a real uh, thing then i went off and did uh, oh and i got a thing coming out with dre as well dr dre nice yeah, vital signs will be coming out on uh, on iTunes. Me, uh, that'll be that'll be uh, me, Sam Rockwell, and Michael Michael K. Williams mm-hmm. playing Dre's um, in it's inside his head, but actually we actually appear with him. But he, I play vengeance. Sam plays ego, and Michael plays um, negativity. <laughs> and it's all about Dre's early. It's about Dre. It's going to come out on I think it's Beats TV, which is Apple's first kind of attempt at streaming. Yeah, doing drugs. so it's a little. It's like hip hop inside beautiful. out. It sounds yeah, like hip hop yeah, inside out. Yeah, it's kind of the story of his life. It's like you know, now I'm this billionaire guy who's out of Compton. Can I trust anybody anymore? Yeah. What goes on in actual life? Because that'll be interesting. And what do you do with your free time when you have free time? I don't. I read a lot. I read. I read. I love watching. Um, I love watching TV. Watch a lot of shows. Um, play a lot of music. Uh, travel a lot. My mother's 95 in England, so I'll oh, go and wow. see her. Yeah, she'll go and see mom two, three times a year. That's great. And my wife's mother is also alive. She's 96, so that's where she is now in Detroit with her. And, um, and my, my, my kids and my grandkids are in London, so I'll go and see them. We just came back from them five weeks with in London, sort of seeing them all before they have their holidays and all yeah. that. And, um, yeah, busy, and I like to work. I, I enjoy what I do. You know, I really, really do. And that's part of my, uh, as I said, when you, we don't, when I got sober, and when you know, said, yeah, this is what you're meant to do, and make the most of it. And there's some fascinating projects, and um, some work out, some don't. <laughs> but America, I'm looking forward to them all, actually. Yeah. But I mean, Hollow Point is a really, because we tried to make it for about two years, and either uh, with Gonzalo, and then it was sort of I was going to do it with Tim. Tim, uh, Tim Oliphant from Deadwood, and, yep. Tim would, and I couldn't do it, so Tim was doing it on his own, and then you know how things do, they slide, right. they were going to make it in Colombia, then they couldn't make it, in, it all fell through, and it came together last year with me and Patrick, so we, I mean, uh, yeah, two years ago, 2014. Well, okay, so that comes out December 16th, uh, yep. and I mean, I, you, you're one of those guys that whenever you're on screen, it's, you know, it's, and the other guy like that is Michael Shannon. So to hear that you guys are in a thing together. Yeah, Michael's good. Yeah, he's a good just, lad. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're, you guys have that thing where it's, so whenever you're on screen, like, I want to watch that guy. Like, I want to know what that guy has to say, you know, and it, and, it, and I, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm sure a lot of it is hard work and t- talent and doing all that stuff. But I, but I do think there is kind of. Alan and I, and um, and we all sat in some, and it was this the Ace Cable Awards in some <laughs> downtown, man, because it was the big earthquake, right? I thought ninety four, yeah, ninety four, January ninety four. January, 94, no, yeah. We all came out for that, yeah, and it was scary. But scary they, but that. they, but Cable was able to say, hey, you know what, guys, we can't pay you as much money, but we'll give you the freedom. We'll give you the freedom, and it's not going to be this large committee. It'll just be a couple of us kind of making the decisions. We'll keep it simple. And, you know, and guess what happens when you let really smart, creative people carry out their vision without a million uh, notes and too much, you know, too much futzing around with it. You get really good stuff. You know, you get really, really, really no, good you stuff. you really do. You really do. I mean, I've met the guy on um, Mr. Robot. Sam. I met Sam. Phenomenal. 
I mean, he did. I mean, I was watching. I, was, I thought, I'll, I'll, you know, you want to go. And I was watching. I thought, yeah, I'll watch a couple of episodes. So you're into it before you know it. You've watched. Four, yeah. Four, like I did with Breaking Bad. Yeah. Because I was never here. Yeah, I was always working away. Yeah. And I remember it was two, it was three. Yeah. It was when we did um, the man, the hollow point. I was waiting, the hollow point. When I, when we were doing that, I finished it and I came back to LA. I couldn't go to England for two weeks. Gwen was there and I was at the beach and I started watching Breaking I thought, I've never seen it. Let me, uh, deliberately. I thought, I'll save it. And I watched all five episodes, uh, five years in like a week. Yeah. I said it was great. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the, and now they just stream it. I mean, they didn't even have streaming. Then, no. Like they do now. No. It's like when the body call will come out next year, American Gods. I mean, that's going out Very on stars. Very excited about that. Do you, were you a fan of the book? Yeah, well, and I, you know, I know Neil. You know Neil. I do yeah. know Neil. Oh, you do? Yeah. And, uh, and that's he's one, amazing. I mean, he's incredible. one of those guys. Incredible. One of those, I mean, when we did comedy, you know, you don't realize what a, he's sort of, he's a god to yeah. those people. Yeah. Well, I did Coraline. That movie, you know, I know, book, yeah, I know. the voiceover for that. But this, is, I mean, he's sort of very varied and very, and very prolific too. Coraline's I mean, one of my favorite animated. As I thought it was beautifully done, didn't you? I Cor- really thought Cor- Henry did a great job. Hodgman's in yeah. that, like that's such a. Great, oh, Hodgman, yeah, John, yeah, yeah. 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 It was very funny. It's such a great. Uh, it's just such a beautiful little movie. You know, such a beautiful movie. And he used three D beautifully. Be- gorgeous. You know, that's the art of doing three D. You know, as opposed to when we did Pirates of the Caribbean when. You know, well, the cameraman, who I love the Darish, Derek, Darish Wolski, who hated it, say, okay, get the fucking red box out, you know. <laughs> okay, put the sword out. They really hate doing 3D, you know. It's for the sake of it. Get the fucking shot for the fucking red box. Get the sword going to the audience like that. <laughs> but, you know, Henry in, in Coraline had thought about and all the flowers, you know. I mean, yes. it's the case, so you have that old concept. But most people just like saying, "Oh, now, now's when we all go in the audience." You know, and the audience goes Whoa! and rolls back. But nobody I've never really seen gives anyone a fuck. do that in a 3D audience ever. Yeah. <laughs> There's a sword coming in. The- I'm in charge for lunch, right? I'll give you a bit. Whatever you want, you know. Well, but you seem pretty. I mean, and I imagine you've been this way always. Always, but you seem pretty centered and. Pretty, you kind of know what you want. You seem to know who you are. Like, you, there's no sense about you of, you know, I'm a tortured artist and I was like, no, yeah, you know, no, no, get no. this job, I'll do this job. No, 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 no. I, I think when I got sober, I was remembering what... Um, How many years? Oh, it's coming up now. God, it's uh, 29 years in January. Fantastic. Congrats. 13. Yeah, thank you. Hmm? 13. 13. I have 13. 13. Good. Yeah. God bless. Yeah. Yeah. The 20, no, it's phenomenal. good to see the 29. It's good to see the 29. Phenomenal. Yeah. And although we're here this morning, I used to, I passed, I was early, and I probably made the car stop at the old place of cold coffee shop. I used to see people getting so back in 29 years ago. So I went in there and had a, had a breakfast. It was kind of nice. Oh, that is nice. It's kind of like a solo meeting on your own. <laughs> <laughs> kind of good. Um, where were we? What was, what was I was it? asking you about the the being centered thing. You said when you got sober, that was very helpful for you. you know, oh yeah, you yeah. Sober. I mean, uh, that was, and I always remember it's the lines of it's um, it's what do you call it? it's flower bear. Flower bear's great line, which a lot of people quote. I know, but it's true when he said, you know, if you if you really, I I knew when it, like fifteen years into my career, like about ten years in, timing was all wrong. Something was wrong, so I decided to have a fucking good time <laughs> for the next fifteen years until it felt right. <laughs> right. Until it felt right, but it's true. I, it's time you feel no. It's the parts of you know you get. I was always very high functioning. You know, I could always work. You know, I was got well paid, took care of stuff. But it was like I was just no. I thought I'll have a good time, and then when I met the love of my life, my wife now Gwen, and then I you know, and after about six years, I got proper sober, and then it was like, yeah. And then I remember the flower quote, which is, you know, live your life like a middle-class bourgeoisie and put all craziness into what you do for a living. And if we're lucky enough to do this, like what you do or what I do, which is, you know, basically fuck about to somebody else for most of your life and you get paid very well for it, then pour everything into that and then lead your life quietly. And it actually it's worked out pretty well. That's fantastic. How do you – I do have a, I do have an alcoholic brain question for you, though. Yeah. Which is – because a lot of people, I get notes from people and they go, well, how, how do I start the process? Or how do I, and I always say, well, you know, just get, get a support structure, whatever your support structure is. Find a meaning, find a therapist, find, a sp- find someone who can help guide you through this process. But it didn't occur to me until about 12 years in that, you know, of course, stopping the thing doesn't just solve the problem. It just sort of clears the table so that you can start to figure out what the problem is. But I am re- I find it very interesting – 
that I've started to identify things about my brain where I go, oh, you're just trying to create drama because you're looking for some sort of an emotional spike that drinking used to give you. So how do you how do you kind of fight all of the the other trappings of what Tan LA and this year's list of performers is insane. Uh, you can see Mel Brooks. Yes, Mel Brooks, Maria Bamford, Jonathan Katz, Ali Wong, Eugene Merman, Nikki Glaser, Kalkanane, Tig Notaro, Adam Devine, Rachel Bloom, Whitney Cummings, Todd Berry, Bobcat Goldthwait. So many more amazing comics as well. Tickets and info can be found at riotla.com. Uh, so here we go. This is Nerdist Podcast number 843 with Ian McShane, who is promoting The Hollow Point which is in theaters uh, December 16th. So you should absolutely have Patrick Wilson is also in that, uh, and uh, the movie looks amazing. Uh, so check it out. Look at the trailer on YouTube. Go see the movie this weekend. Uh, here's the Nerdist Podcast with Ian McShane. Katie, roll the thing. Now entering Nerdist.com. It's the holiday season. Is there eight of little ones inside there? There's, yeah, it's a nesting chocolate. There's, uh, they just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Do you need anything? Are you good? Do you the want is fun. Water? No, no, I'm not fun. Excellent. What are you guys shooting afterwards? Are you doing a magazine cover? No, no, what are we doing? George Pinocchio. George I think with him. George oh, cool. Up in here for ABC, whatever, yeah. Very cool. Well, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming all the way to our studio in the middle of town. But you live, you My live. Place. No, I live at the beach. I just got back from New York yesterday last night, and I live at the beach, so it's nice. Get down to Venice, unpack. My Hi. wife went to Detroit to see her mum, so I got up five o'clock this morning, did the washing, Chris. Yes, you do. You know? Yeah, as you have to. You're I lime to. machine those machines. You know, <laughs> getting back. Here, a little bit of that, a little bit of bleach. <laughs> You do your. Got up, did a walk on the beach, and then went in for a. Yeah, got me to see you. You're you a know. you're a do your own laundry kind of guy. Oh well, yeah, in my day, you did that's what you did. Yeah, you had to do your own. And had to do your own. Did you ever feel like that if you got to a point in your career where you refused to do your own laundry, that that was that was going to be a problem? Like that that you do you feel, do you keep grounded by doing your own laundry? Uh, well, no, I've, I've, I've married three times and none of my wives do laundry, so... Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying it's just important you do your own laundry. And your own cooking. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Have to, have what do you like to cook? Bit. What do you cook? I haven't cooked much lately because I've been on the move, so I don't travel with a little hot plate and things like that. You know, people do. I think Jeremy Irons once said he, he traveled with a lot of scarves to make hotel rooms look like... I thought, <laughs> where the hell did you come from, Jeremy? You know? <laughs> A brothel in Istanbul somewhere. No, I don't trouble with anything. I like the rooms to look like they are. No cooking. Uh, no, well, now, you know, well, it used to... Because they'd never done a TV show before. They'd never done a TV series. I mean, one's a novelist and the other one. And I think they... Um, they had the idea for the show, and I think they made it and then scrapped it and did it all again. Oh, wow. With the, the first pilot yeah. of Game of Thrones. Which was called Tits and Dragons. Which was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was Dragons and Tits. Dragons and Tits, yeah. And then they, yeah. they focus group that. It didn't like, very well. No, you know, tits, tits, first, tits, tits first, then the dragons. That's, that's so Those are the order people like to see things in. Yeah. Yeah. A dragon? Oh, I thought this was going to be tit. Well, hang on. <laughs> All right. Well, you should flip the... Okay. But I, the, thing that's, the, thing that is, uh, the thing that I love about that show is just the idea that they have this wonderful mechanism in, in place where you... Everyone has a goal. Like... Some shows, you know, they have to develop goals throughout the series, and or every year they have to solve whatever their problem is, and they solve, and then they come back the next year. But Game of Thrones, you know, everyone's trying to get to that throne, and that's it. And that that is it, that drives the story from any direction that you always have that to fall back on. And it looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. And the guy that I think is the real sort of not create well, he is creative genius, yeah, because he's the guy that organizes the um, the shooting of it. Because, you know, they have two units constantly shooting and they go back and forth. So his, there's one guy, I forget his name, his producer, he's an English guy, and he's the one that works out. You know, they have one shoot, they have one shooting either in Spain or Croatia, wherever their location is, and one shooting permanently in Belfast. And it's how they interlock and have the actors going across and back and forth and interlocking. I think that's the genius of it. Yeah. And they make it work that way. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Manchester, mm-hmm. England. 
Stratford, actually, Stratford, the home of Manchester United. Yeah. Who my father played for. Yeah, that, this I, I so read. It's kind of nice when I go back to school, when I go back to Manchester because it's not Ian McShane; it's Harry's lad. Oh, that's oh, sweet. It's, yeah, it's great. I was there two weeks ago at the, the game at Old Trafford, so they all know me as you know Harry's kid. And you know, did you ever play? Bit. Yeah, I played, but I wasn't I wasn't good enough. I mean, I played with a couple of guys who were. Yeah, when I was like nine and ten and played early, and then, but I played with a couple of guys who were really went on to be pros. The difference at eight and nine at that level is is enormous. You know, you know, and having grown up with it, my dad being a pro, you know, when you're nine. I mean, I was not, I wasn't bad. I still love, I loved it until I mean, I quit playing. I used to play here with Rod Stewart and all that lot, and they used to have the we used to have games in the seventies up at the Coldwater. oh, that's amazing. Cold water fire, cold cold water canyon fire station. We'd all be there. Playing, and then we used to play in Balboa Park. When all the all the when you get the real ethnic variety down there, you get the Venezuela, all the South Americans playing, and all the Europeans in Darius teams. We used to have them on Balboa Park. Yeah. Oh my God, I had no idea. So it's like a mini World Cup, basically. Mini World yeah. Cup, yeah. Yeah. But it was good. But uh, but you know, it's um, it's a great game. I mean, but the difference is between why it'll never catch on here. Premier League. I mean, how many football teams do you have in this country? NFL. You don't have that many. I don't know. What are well, the there? country's so vast. You've got at least 100 teams in England in four, in four different divisions. The Premier League, the first division, the second division, the third division, who are all supported crazily by people who live in their local towns. Oh, right. And travel up and down the country. But, I mean, that's why here you don't really get people traveling away to football games, you know. No. It's too vast anyway. This yeah, the country's too big. The country's big, yeah. really big. I'm always jealous of uh, comedians in uh, in the UK because they can basically just keep touring in a circle around a landmass the size of California. And here, when we tour here, it's like you know, oh, you got to go, you know, you got to go to the East Coast, you know. Okay, and they, that's a whole day to get there, you know. But you just hop on a train, you could just do shows all no, the way they do, around. Absolutely, the and that, then there's a there's an enormous um, appetite for it, you know. But, I mean, there are those comics. You know, I love those comics who've never appeared on TV, which you have a lot of those in England, mainly before because they were too rude. Right, right. You know, blue, those comics you played in working man's clubs. Or right. now you've got comics like, I mean, the, like, what is it? The paid, one of the highest paid. He doesn't do TV. Russell Peters. Who's Russell a great, Peters. Great right. comic. Yeah. yeah. But he never does TV. Yeah, it's great. It's kind of great in one It's way. great if you don't have to. It's really great if you don't have to, but in order to sustain that, you really do have to tour. Like, yeah, well, he does nonstop, nonstop, and plays those huge stadiums. I know. I, know. I mean, that's incredible. We don't have a or lot. Bill of... Hicks, who appeared on television 120 times, and they took him off 124 times. Remember? Oh yeah. Hicks used to go on. <laughs> well, he would. He was purposely just trying to. He's a great guy. He man. was amazing. I mean, he was purposely just fucking with people, and you know. It just <laughs> he was huge in England. I mean, I'm sure he, he, was. he was. Oh yeah, that's where. All, oh huge. That's where. There's also um, what's that? What's the other great Rich Hall. Rich great Hall. Man. Yeah, Rich he, Hall. He plays there all the time. Rich, you know, he's a terrific comic. But you don't see him. I mean, they play. He's like a sort of a, a guest Englishman. You know. Mm -hmm. Then they do all those um, Edinburgh, Edinburgh, every year Edinburgh Festival. Yeah, where all the comics from all over the world go. And yeah, because sometimes what you know, like shows. What can happen is if you tour in the states. And you're not necessarily as well known. You play for a lot of rooms where the the the, the tickets are free, and they're just yeah. trying to get people in there yeah. and to get drunk. And I think for some some comedians, they just don't feel like anyone's really listening to them. And there's so much comedy in such a concentrated area uh, over there that it's just it's just more appealing to kind of find your audience. And stick well, and you have them. a lot of comedy shows on TV too. You know, I mean, you have like Never Mind the Buzzcocks, yeah, which Jimmy. I'm sure you'd love. You yeah, know, you 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 do stand up, Chris. I do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I do. But I mean, you have a lot. But I mean, Never Mind the Buzzcocks. They have that thing with Q. QI with Q. Stephen, Stephen, which Fry. is a very funny show, and they have yeah. various. So there's a there's a lot of shows for new talent that comes up there, which which doesn't happen here so much. You know? No, we don't. Uh, they don't encourage that. You do it. Um, because they'd never done a TV show before. They'd never done a TV series. I mean, one's a novelist and the other one. And I think they um, they had the idea for the show, and I think they made it and then scrapped it and did it all again. Oh, wow. With the, the first pilot yeah. of Game of Thrones. Which was called Tits and Dragons. Which was called, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was Dragons and Tits. Dragons and, and Tits, yeah. And then they, right, they yeah. focus group that. It didn't like, very well. No, you know, tits, tits, first, tits first, Tits first, then the Dragons. That's, that's, so those are the order people like to see things in. Yeah. Yeah, a dragon. Oh, I thought this was going to be tit. Well, hang on. <laughs> All right. Well, you should flip the. Okay. But I, the thing that's the thing that is uh, the thing that I love about that show 
is just the idea that they have this wonderful mechanism in, in place where you everyone has a goal. Like some shows, you know, they have to develop goals throughout the series, and or every year they have to solve whatever their problem is, and they solve, and then they come back the next year. But Game of Thrones, you know, everyone's trying to get to that throne. And that's it. And that that is it. that drives the story from any direction that you always have that to fall back on. And it looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. And the guy that I think is the real sort of not create. Well, he is creative genius. Yeah, because he's the guy that organizes the um, the shooting of it. Because you know they have two units constantly shooting and they go back and forth. So his there's one guy I forget his name is producer, he's an English guy, and he's the one that works out. You know they have one shoot, they have one shooting either in Spain or Croatia, wherever their location is, and one shooting permanently in Belfast. And it's how they interlock and have the actors going across and back and forth and interlocking. I think that's the genius of it. Yeah, and they make it work that way. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Manchester, mm-hmm. England, Stratford actually, Stratford. The home of Manchester United, yeah, who my father played for. Yeah, that this I, I so read. It's kind of nice when I go back to school, when I go back to Manchester because it's not Ian McShane, it's Harry's lad. Oh, that's oh, sweet. It's, yeah, it's great. I was there two weeks ago at the, the game at Old Trafford, so they all know me as you know Harry's kid. You Did know, you ever play? Bit. Yeah, I played, but I wasn't I wasn't good enough. I mean, I played with a couple of guys who were yeah when I was like nine and ten and played early, and then, but I played with a couple of guys who were really went on to be pros. The difference at eight and nine at that level is, is enormous, you know, you know. And having grown up with it, my dad being a pro, you know when you're nine. I mean, I, was not, I wasn't bad. I still love. I loved it until, I mean, I quit playing. I used to play here with Rod Stewart and all that lot. And they used to have, the, they used to have games in the 70s up at the Coldwater. Oh, that's amazing. Coldwater Fire Station, Coldwater Canyon Fire Station. We'd all be there playing. And then we used to play in Balboa Park when, all the, all the, when you get the real ethnics variety down there you get the venezuela all the south americans playing and all the europeans in darius teams we used to have them on balboa park yeah oh my god i had no idea so it's like a mini world cup basically mini world yeah. Cup, yeah yeah but it was good but uh, but you know it's um it's a great game i mean but the difference is between why it is uh the thing that i love about that show is just the idea that they have this wonderful mechanism in, in place where you everyone has a goal like some shows, you know, they have to develop goals throughout the series and, or every year they have to solve whatever their problem is and they solve and then they come back the next year. But Game of Thrones, you know everyone's trying to get to that throne. And that's it. And that, that, is it, that drives the story from any direction that you always have that to fall back on. And it looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. And the guy that I think is the real sort of not create – well, he is creative genius, yeah, because he's the guy that organizes the, um, the shooting of it. Because, you know, they have two units constantly shooting and they go back and forth. So his, there's one guy, I forget his name, his producer, he's an English guy, and he's the one that works out. You know, they have, one shoot, they have one shooting either in Spain or Croatia, wherever their location is, and one shooting permanently in Belfast. And it's how they interlock and have the actors going across and back and forth and interlocking. I think that's the genius of it. Yeah. And they make it work that way. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Manchester, mm-hmm. England. Stratford, actually, Stratford, the home of Manchester United, yeah, who my father played for. Yeah, that, this I, I so read. It's kind of nice when I go back to school, when I go back to Manchester because it's not Ian McShane; it's Harry's lad. Oh, that's oh, sweet. It's, yeah, it's great. I was there two weeks ago at the, the game at Old Trafford, so they all know me as you know Harry's kid. You Did know, you ever play? Bit. Yeah, I played, but I wasn't I wasn't good enough. I mean, I played with a couple of guys who were. Yeah, when I was like nine and ten, and played early, and then I played with a couple of guys who were really went on to be pros. The difference at eight and nine at that level is, is enormous, you know, you know. And having grown up with it, my dad being a pro, you know when you're nine. I mean, I, was not, I wasn't bad. I still love. I loved it until, I mean, I quit playing. I used to play here with Rod Stewart and all that lot. And they used to have, the, they used to have games in the 70s up at the Coldwater. Oh, that's amazing. Coldwater Fire Station. Coldwater Canyon Fire Station. We'd all be there playing. And then we used to play in Balboa Park when, all the, all the, when you get the real ethnics variety down there you get the venezuela all the south americans playing and all the europeans in darius teams we used to have them on balboa park yeah oh my god i had no idea so it's like a mini world cup basically mini world yeah. Cup, yeah yeah but it was good but uh, but you know it's um it's a great game i mean but the difference is between why it'll never catch on here is because it's kind of still tribal in england you know it's real tribal i mean it's really like you know every every team has their own every town has their own football team right 
I mean, it's not just that you have the Premier League. I mean, how many football teams do you have in this country? NFL, you don't have that many. I don't know. What are well, the there? country's so vast. You've got at least 100 teams in England in four, in four different divisions. The Premier League, the First Division, the Second Division, the Third Division, who are all supported crazily by people who live in their local towns. Oh, right. And travel up and down the country. But, I mean, that's why here you don't really get people traveling away to football games, you know. No. It's too vast the next year and looking, putting all our weight behind it. Oh my so God. we're putting him out on Saturday night at 10 o'clock. Yeah, and they go, it didn't perform very well. Did you tell no. anyone about it? No. <laughs> no, not one commercial? Nah, fuck everyone. Well, you know, it's like, you wa- I remember watching a nature, I was watching a nature show once where it's, the, you know, a new, a new head of the lion pride has come in. The new male, he's defeated the reigning male comes in and then just and gruesomely just you know starts killing all of the young just walking around and breaking their necks and you're like that's that's network that's television network television yeah, a new exec comes in and breaks all the necks of the uh, all the that's shows that are already do. there you know but in the end of the, at the end of the day do you just sort of feel like well you know i got to work and it was fine well yeah and, that's yeah. what i meant you got yeah. to work it and it's you know it's on, it's on dvd it's like it lies forever in the dvd hall of fame you know whatever mm-hmm. but um a michael green did that and uh, Brian Fuller, yep. the very gifted Brian Fuller from, um, you know, uh, what was it show called? Pushing Daisies yep. and uh, Hannibal. Brian's very gig. So the two of them are really interesting pair together. They write quite differently, but I mean, together they're inventive. And I always thought when I read the book, Guyman, who was around, and Neil's on it as an executive producer, that actually the book is like, it's like a blueprint for TV series. You remember it at all? I don't know, but you know, it's like because it, he leaves a lot out. He just leaves it open there. That's how do you do the TV show? And it's, it's the book because he leaves so many sort of areas uncovered. He jumps around, then he has separate stories come into it. It's a very in- strange book, American Gods. A lot of people love it. You know, they're obsessed by it. And um, I think we get we um, we end we end the uh, series, the first series. Assuming there might, there might be a second. <laughs> you, know, you never know, Christy. You, just don't, you don't know. Absolutely you never don't know. Even know. The, and you, you know that stars wanted to be huge and Fremantle wanted to of be huge. Of course they do. But you never know. Right. Um, but I know we ended at a, a point which, you know, is a very good point, a very good area where you just know, actually, you get to know what the show is about. Not sort of halfway through before the, they all meet at the, uh, the House on the Rock. Mm-hmm. Whatever. So the House on the Rock, well, for those who know, you know what I'm talking about? House on the Rock, that'll be the second year. Great. If there's a second year. Yeah, you just, you just, you just hope that when you're working on something, some, some executive doesn't come in and go, this is going to be huge. Like, God damn it, why don't you say that? that? But they always say that. They always this say that. It's going to be great. You just, you're be you just great. never know. What percentage of your year do you, devote, do you like to work and have off? This year's been a, a, a long one. I mean, I did a... Um, I finished off last this time last year. We finished off John Wick Two, which yep. comes out in January. Then I went and did uh, this this rather charming movie with um, Michael Shannon oh. and uh, Ron Perlman called Pottersville, which is a sort of like a it's kind of like an it's a wonderful life, like a, a, a charming Americans. <laughs> while I do this big speech and talk to them or whatever, and said like just let me do it. Don't sort of you know because there are people reading you know with you sometimes. And David just was there. I'd met him, and we talked about it. And he just said, you know, and that was it. And then we waited for the word from Chris Albrecht from on high, and it came within like a two two hours. Oh, my and, God. Uh, and that was it, yeah. So it was good. But, what? I mean, that was it. They were, they were, they'd been having trouble with that part. So why, I don't know. But the, luckily, it was, you know, it was, there it was. What do you think the rationale behind British television is where they only want to do a few episodes here and a few episodes I don't episodes know. There. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing. It's this... I don't really know. They don't... Well, they don't have syndication in the same way they do here because this is such a huge country. I mean, that's half of it. When they do TV, they want to, they want to get a serious set of, a set of you know, episodes so they can sell them to syndication and right. make the money on them. But BBC was like... Well, it's certainly nothing to do with quality because I think, you know... Um, it's an, it still goes on. Not so much anymore. They do eight now. <laughs> <laughs> but they do. It's literally, they do eight. Eight shows. But that's like a big year, you know. But, but it's like a big thought. Well, we'll do eight, you know. Or we'll see how it goes. But, you know, I mean, nowadays it's the goal. I mean, it is the golden age of TV now. What have you got? 450 cable shows vying together. There's it a is. lot of really I think good. It really is. 
oh, there are a lot of yeah. really good stuff. It's when too people much. say, do you want to watch that? And you say, I've never, when do you get a chance to see it, you know? I know. And people who are able to watch everything, I don't know. They must not have jobs. I people are like, have you seen this? Have you seen this? No. You, no, I, no time for anything. I work. I mean, I can tr- catch up as much as I possibly can, but that's not a lot. But I wonder if some of it has to do, because I, I see the upside and the downside. The upside being, you know, you can really focus on quality for eight episodes but I also feel like there are certain characters, oh, it would have it been nice to see how that developed. Or it would have been nice to see where that person was in se- season three usually feels like that's where everyone's firing on all cylinders by the second or third season of a show. And I wonder how many amazing British shows just didn't get that chance to really lock in because it was just. They seem now to be more. Well, I mean, they seem now to be more um, on the BBC and the ITV seem more. In the sort of regular kind of like um, regular TV, bay. Mm-hmm. Look, shows like Call the Midwife, mm-hmm. the 30s, they stick to stock things that work. Well, they do them very well, and I'm, God knows I'm not knocking them, but they do them very well. But shows like Happy Valley, did you see that? Which is a sort of a story about a distraught female detective from the north. No. So like, it's a really good show, really interesting, interesting villain, a complicated home life for the cop, a female cop. Um, the diversity is with this very good actress, Sarah Lancashire, um, and very well written. Um, Peter Moore, which we did in January in upstate New York, that'll be out next year. And then I went to England, did a boxing movie with Ray Winston, me, and a guy called Johnny Harris, who wrote it. Again, Johnny is sober like five years, and this is about a boxer who's gone down, slid down the way, and comes back. And this is that's one of the reasons I did it, because it, it, it's about the meetings, it's about the, it's about the, our thing, as my mother-in-law used to say, you're, you're, that thing you're in. <laughs> <laughs> my mother-in-law used to say, that thing you're in. I said, yeah, but this is, it's about that. And <laughs> How's that thing you're in? Well, How's that thing? Know, it's going it's pretty it's well. Been, good, good. Yeah, 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 I think we're going to stick with it. Yeah. Stick with it. It's going to be and, a real uh, thing. And then it went off and did, uh, oh, and i got a thing coming out with Dre as well, Dr. Dre. Nice. Yeah, Vital Signs will be coming out on uh, on iTunes. Me, uh, that'll, be, that'll be me, Sam Rockwell, and Michael... Michael K. Williams mm-hmm. playing Dre's um, in his, inside his head, but actually we actually appear with him. But he, I play Vengeance, Sam plays Ego, and Michael plays um, Negativity. <laughs> and it's all about Dre's early... It's about Dre... It's going to come out on... I think it's Beats TV, which is Apple's first kind of attempt at streaming. Yeah. Doing so it's a little... It's like hip-hop inside beautiful. out. It sounds yeah, like hip-hop yeah, inside out. Yeah, it's kind of a story of his life. It's like, you know, now I'm this billionaire guy who's out of Compton. Can I trust anybody anymore? Yeah. What goes on in actual life? Because that'll be interesting. And what do you do with your free time when you have free time? I don't read. I read a lot. I read. I read. I love watching... Um, I love watching TV. Watch a lot of shows. Um, play a lot of music. Uh, travel a lot. My mother's 95 in England, so I'll oh, go back and wow. see her. Yeah, she'll go back and see mom two, three times a year. That's great. And my wife's mother is also alive. She's 96, so that's where she is now in Detroit with her. And, um, and my, my, my kids and my grandkids are in London, so I'll go and see them. Just came back from them, five weeks with in London, sort of seeing them all before they have their holidays and all yeah. that. And, um, yeah, busy, and I like to work. I, I enjoy what I do. You know, I really, really do. And that's part of my, uh, as I said, when you, we don't, when I got sober, and when you know, said, yeah, this is what you're meant to do, and make the most of it. And there's some fascinating projects, and um, some work out, some don't. <laughs> but America, I'm looking forward to them all, actually. Yeah, but I mean, Hollow Point is a really, because we tried to make it for about two years, and either um, with Gonzalo, and then it was sort of I was going to do it with Tim. Tim, uh, Tim Oliphant from Deadwood, and, yep. Tim would, and I couldn't do it, so Tim was doing it on his own, and then you know how things do, they slide, right. they were going to make it in Colombia, then they couldn't make it, in, it all fell through, and it came together last year with me and Patrick, so we, I mean, uh, yeah, two years ago, 2014. Well, okay, so that comes out December 16th, uh, yep. and I mean, I, you, you're one of those guys that whenever you're on screen, it's, you know, it's, and the other guy like that is Michael Shannon. So to hear that you guys are in a thing together. Yeah, Michael's good. Yeah, he's a good just, lad. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're, you guys have me back at the time. Well, it all, it, it all yeah, we, no, well, we've been told and then suddenly, but of course they hadn't picked up those little slips of paper, which sure. are, you know, a month. And uh, before that happened, they just they canceled it. Who knows whatever went on? You'll hear 10 different stories of it. It was very expensive. Yes. It was very complicated. Milch works in a certain way, but it was definitely the best, I mean, I think, for all of us involved because we still talk about I mean, there's talk about it now. They're writing a script. But, you know, I'll believe it when I'm on that 
muddy street in my boots. You know? <laughs> I know. Looking I at s- Timothy Oliphant, both of us saying, "Are we here again doing it, or is it just a, a pipe dream?" I would, I was, I would, I would see Kim Dickens quite a lot because she's doing that other Walking she's Dead very, show. Yeah, she's yeah, amazing, and yeah. every time I see her, I'm like, "You know what I mean?" Dead, you? She's like, "I mean, we're dead. I we hear about it, but I don't know." Yeah, we all what's hear, and then we get in touch, and then they say. David's writing a script. I mean, but, you know, now would seem a perfect time. It's 10 years since they, they elbowed it. It's 10 years, you know, it's kind of like it's perfect time. Tim's got a huge following from, uh, you know, the show he did, Justified. Yep. All the other people are free. Most of, well, None of us will be free for much longer. Right. But maybe it is just, you know, blowing smoke up our asses. <laughs> but <laughs> Who Swearingen, knows? they were all real people. They were all Swearingen. Yeah, was a real Swearingen, guy. yeah, Swearingen was a real guy. And so was Bullock, who was mm-hmm. a friend of... Um, what do you call it? The first, uh, what was your, what was your friend? Theodore Roosevelt mm-hmm. became a big friend of his in the justice. Uh, yeah, it was all based on, um, on real stuff, but obviously Milch took his liberties with it, whatever. I don't think that probably that Swearingen, the original guy, was half as interesting as Milch wrote him to be, you know, and got, but the, got the gift of playing him. Everyone was, I mean, it was, it was like um, well, that's Old Mil- West but, Shakespeare. But that's what Milch does. Milch's genius is that he, you know, he didn't, he didn't have me come down the stairs every week and kill somebody and make a long speech, which he would if it was on, right, you know, normal TV. What he did was he built every, every guy and every woman on that show had their own individual personality. And it was the story of the town. And as the town grew... And how, you know, um, Swearingen learned to live with Bullock. Bullock learned to live with him. It's like, you know, you take care of your side of the street. I'll take care of mine. And then when Hearst came in, they both realized that's real power. Yeah. How do you deal with real power? You shut your fucking mouth until something happens. That's why it was all, you know, you didn't have any big face-offs between Swearingen and and Hearst. Because what? Well, Swearingen knew. It was ridiculous. You know, he got the pleasure of killing one of his men, but that was it. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that... That fight scene between your guy and his guy. Oh, yeah, that was phenomenal. And the it? genius part about it was how much it fucked him up for, like, because it's so graphic and he rips the guy's eyeball out. Yeah. And, and, and he, in, I think in most television shows, you know, he'd write it off and be like, yeah, I just killed that guy. But it, it legitimately shakes that guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and you see the, everyone's vulnerability. Well, I think that's what the show did. The show, did, you know, upended Norm. Be interested to see this because Ang Lee is a terrific filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, the guy has really made some great movies. So it'll be worth seeing what what he's actually done. Yeah, this movie because he took a chance on what was his name? And he did Hidden Crouching Dragon. Didn't he? Yeah, Crouching Dragon, which Hidden is yeah. great, beautiful. So it'll be worth seeing what he's done. Anyway. So, so basically, what you're saying is the Deadwood movie should be in 3D, right? Oh, no, don't, don't, don't even go. Oh, back to Deadwood. Wouldn't it be nice to be, wouldn't it be nice if they just said, yeah, go and make it, you know, get the two hours. Everybody will be happy. Everybody's satisfied. Put on the glasses, and we can Al's. finish it. Al's glasses, can yeah. you imagine? Yeah. 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 Get the gimp, and then the mop comes into the audience. Whoa! No, they're putting that thing down my dick. Which is the thing. They're, they're, oh, my God. They're pulling out the stones, oh, you know. The no. stones. I don't think exactly. there was, I don't think there was a male who had a pulse that watched that and didn't like yeah, go no, up on your tiptoes little bit of, whoa. when you went on your... I know. <laughs> no, whoa. Have you, ever yeah. had, have you ever had kidney stones? Before? Oh, yeah. Oh, you have? It's like being, I had one when I was like, yeah, God, it was... And it, it is like being kicked in the balls by, a, you know, a, a 30, you know, a 350-pound linebacker. Oh, my God. No, it, it's a weird feeling. And then, of course, you pass it and you don't even know you've had it. I, but I had the one. I know of a friend of mine who makes them, you know. <laughs> They do. People make them. So I just say, stop drinking red wine, you know, because that's gravel. It's like people do. They have to, it's a regular occurrence, but it's a terrible thing, kidney stones. Ooh. Yeah, I know. I know. My wife now is they zap them. them. They just zap yeah. them out and break yeah. them down. Yeah. 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 Uh, was there, do you think there was any, uh, when, you, when you realized at nine years old, well, I'm probably not going to be a football player. Like, do, was, your parent, was your dad cool with that when you're like, I think Oh, I- my dad was the greatest guy ever. He was great. He was fantastic. I mean, I never had a ride with him. He was a really... He's a really terrific human being. Um, and he coached, when he gave up football, he had a job, because in those days, you know, in the 50s, I mean, it wasn't, you know, he had, a, he had a full-time job. When he left football, he was scouted. He stayed in the Manchester area. And he stayed on as, um, he worked for a company called Massey Ferguson as uh, personnel, you know, called Human Resources, mm-hmm. you call it. And he stayed at United Training, and he used to train, um, he used to go, like, coach kids in school, soccer. Yeah. 
So, but he, no, my dad wasn't this kind of forceful guy. No, he wasn't like, you have to do this. You, and he, he, knew, he, he wasn't going to push me into something that I was. And if you're not as good as your dad, my dad was a pro, you know. I mean, you're going to, you know. I don't think talent is genetic, you know, in those forms. Some of it is. It can be physically sometimes, but I don't think, like, acting doesn't run in our family. You know, my mother's not, my father. And I certainly didn't when I was, like, it wasn't like the alternative to football. I didn't start making little, you know, making little theatres. <laughs> like a lot of actors do when they say, I was at a yen, you know, I, I built my little theatres and cut out little people and read. I said, no, 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 I didn't do that. I just like playing sports. You smoke, you can always say, but you don't do that. I you don't. Yeah. No, exactly. So you have problems saying, I don't think I'm just going out for a cigarette. Like when you're on a film set with a bad actor or a boring <laughs> person, you go... Uh, I'm just going out for a cigarette while you discuss your problems Shit, with the director. Shit, so you just you know said I mean? that now, so if halfway through this, you're like, I'm just going to go for a smoke. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll fuck. know what you're doing then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm worried you're going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I can't make the excuse. I am very excited that, I mean, not only I'm such a huge fan of yours, but also, I mean, De- Deadwood to me, you know, and my wife, incidentally, her great-great-grandfather was George Hurst. Oh, my goodness. And so she had never seen it. So when we first started dating, I was like, well, surely you've seen Deadwood. Oh, no, no. Actually, I didn't point. I'd forgotten. And I said, have you seen Deadwood? And she goes, no, I think my great, great grandfather's. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding? Oh, my God. <laughs> and, uh, and I showed it to her. And her reaction was, he was just misunderstood. Like, that was her reaction. No, that, she, that's what I said about my character. <laughs> She's stolen that line. Hers was a bad guy, you know that. <laughs> he was He's a, a really bad he guy. He was misunderstood. That's the, what they say about every bad character. Now. No. You know, complex, complicated. He was mis- it was a complicated. It was a different it's time. It's a different time. He just went in and got all the la- leases for the, you know, the gold and the ore and, you know, screwed everybody that was in his way. But an early Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> He's not the same. Well, you've got, you've got Hearst Town. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, but that doesn't... Sound Simeon is very strange. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. It is, it is amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, yeah it was such a, a, just a strange feat in the, you know, in the early 1900s. Like, let's just build a castle there. I don't know. Bring nothing. it all over from Italy, whatever. Bring everything yeah. over and from ship over. it all in there. It was just like an architectural salvage. And in the end, all you wanted was a sled. Rosebud. <laughs> <laughs> that was a movie was a- made by a hack director. <laughs> oh yeah, who, a real hack director who just he was only doing bought- a hatchet job on this very nice man. I saw it again recently. It is pretty good, actually. You know, yeah, it's quite remarkable. Yeah, uh, but uh, but you know what's remarkable to me is that how uh, how empathetic people were to Swearingen's character in that because he I, I, ostensibly should be like, well, he's kind of the bad guy, really. He's sort of the villain. Well, I don't think you see, I, I think the genius of the show is Milch, Milch, David Milch, who is a bona fide genius. Yes. The guy, I mean, that's, it's all about him. I mean, he's the one that envisioned it. I mean, I remember when he first went in, I think he pitched them Rome and they said, we're already doing a series about that. He said, fine. And they mind racing quickly. I'm on a Western. <laughs> then he came up, but um, what he came up with was really, it's the story of America. I mean, it's a very political show in terms of what it does is tells you how, if you like, a certain civilization is created. You know, there's a lot of bad guys, a lot of guys around. The girls who are around are all whores or whatever or treated badly by the men, and suddenly civilization creeps in, law comes in, and we were just getting going when, you know, H wanted to be huge and Fremantle wanted to of be huge. Of course they do. But you never know. Right. Um, but I know we ended at a, po- a point which, you know, is a very good point, a very good area where you just know, actually you get to know what the show is about. Not sort of halfway through before the they all meet at the uh, the house on the rock, mm-hmm. whatever. So the house on the rock. Well, for those who know, you know what I'm talking about. House on the rock. That'll be the second year. Great. If there's a second year. Yeah, you just you just you just hope that when you're working on something, some some executive doesn't come in and go, "This is going to be huge." Like, God damn it! <laughs> why you say that? say that? But they always say they always this say is that. Gonna be great. You and just, you're going to be You just great. never know. What percentage of your year do you devote? Do you like to work and have off? This year's been a, a, a long one. I mean, I did a, um, I finished off last, this time last year, we finished off John Wick 2, which yep. comes out in January. Then I went and did uh, this, this rather charming movie with um, Michael Shannon oh. and uh, Ron Perlman called Pottersville, which is a sort of like a, it's kind of like an It's a Wonderful Life, like a, a, a charming American story. 
which we did in January in upstate New York. That'll be out next year. And then I went to England, did a boxing movie with Ray Winston, me, and a guy called Johnny Harris, who wrote it. Again, Johnny is sober like five years, and this is about a boxer who's gone down, slid down the way, and comes back. And this is that's one of the reasons I did it, because it, it, it's about the meetings. It's about the... It's about the our thing, as my mother-in-law said, you're, yeah, that thing you're in. <laughs> <laughs> my mother-in-law used to say, that thing you're in. I said, yeah, but this is, it's about that. And <laughs> How's that thing you're in? Well, How's that thing? Know, it's going it's pretty it's well. Been, good, good. Yeah, 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 I think I'm going to stick with yeah. it. I'm going to stick with it. It's going to be and, a real uh, thing. And then I went off and did, uh, oh, and i got a thing coming out with Dre as well, Dr. Dre. Nice. Yeah, Vital Signs will be coming out on uh, on iTunes. Me, uh, that'll be, that'll be uh, me, Sam Rockwell, and Michael... Michael K. Williams mm-hmm. playing Dre's um, in his, inside his head, but actually we actually appear with him. But he, I play Vengeance, Sam plays Ego, and Michael plays um, Negativity. <laughs> and it's all about Dre's early... It's about Dre... It's going to come out on... I think it's Beats TV, which is Apple's first kind of attempt at streaming. Yeah. Doing so it's a little... It's like hip-hop inside beautiful. out. It sounds yeah, like hip-hop yeah, inside out. Yeah, it's kind of story of his life. It's like, you know, now I'm this billionaire guy who's out of Compton. Can I trust anybody anymore? Or yeah. What goes on in actual life? Because that'll be interesting. And what do you do with your free time when you have free time? I don't read. I read a lot. I read. I read. I love watching... Um, I love watching TV. Watch a lot of shows. Um, play a lot of music. Uh, travel a lot. My mother's 95 in England, so I'll oh, go and wow. see her. Yeah, she'll go and see mom two, three times a year. That's great. And my wife's mother is also alive. She's 96, so that's where she is now in Detroit with her. And, um, and my, my, my kids and my grandkids are in London, so I'll go and see them. I just came back from them five weeks with in London, sort of. Well, I think that's what the show did. The show did, you know, upended norms. It wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a typical TV show. I mean, it came it's a long time ago now, you know. I mean, we did the pilot 14 years ago. Oh, my God. 2002. That's crazy. And we waited a year before they started the show actual, the show proper in August 2003. Mm-hmm. Then we did three years. Seems like a lot longer. Seems like, I mean, seems like a... Uh, it seems like we did more shows than we did because it was a remarkable... Um, time for everybody i mean it was you know everybody got on everybody brought their a game it's a remarkable three years of experiencing other actors who just love being there who was al to you did you did your relationship with him kind of develop through the three yeah well it developed through i mean i think it developed through david i mean because david writes in a way which is which they gave in space to at the time obviously because we cancelled after three years they got a little wary of it but david tends to write a scene then sees it played, like most good showrunners do, and then sees where that's leading to, and then doesn't sort of shoot the next bit. He goes back and rewrites. But we were in a very fortunate position, Chris, because at the time when we did it, we were all at the ranch, Gene Orchard's ranch up in San Clarita, mm-hmm. Santa Clarita, and everybody was there. Everything was there. The writers were there. The sets were there. The the, um, the extras, the horses were there. So there was no, like, location. You didn't have to be in three locations a day. He could actually right and say an editing editing facilities were there so everybody was everybody was there the entire time so he could say let's take an hour i'm going to change the next scene after lunch or i'm going to adjust this or we'll do this it only meant crossing the road and we had two sound stages there. Mm-hmm. so it only meant moving up the street physically for a location or moving back into a studio so it wasn't it was a it was a really as it was a a most perfect way to do a show as i've ever met ever met do you like doing television because i think was it did you do love joy for nine seasons no 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 i had the big i had the i had the idea for love joy i bought the um um original uh rights to the books in 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 85 with a great friend of mine alan McEwen. Tracy Ullman's yes. husband, Alan, who my dear friend. And um, Alan and I did one series for the BBC, but it was actually it was the first, one of the first independent shows because we produced it. Because they said, oh, we'll, we'll do it. And we said, no, what's the point? We'll do it. We'll produce it. But, you know, we'll do it with you. Give us the money and we'll take care of it. And we did one season. It was very successful. And then a guy called Michael Gray came in, who was um, rather, he flopped in America, but was one of those cigar chewing like, good old boys, mm. back in England, became the BBC and said, oh, yeah, this Charlotte will take over. And he'd previously had run-ins with Alan, because Alan was one of those very, Alan, you know, I've known Alan. Alan was a hairdresser the first time I met him on a movie. Back in, if it's too 